I didn't go to school. I didn't go to because only one of us had shoes and we had to choose who wore the shoes, even though they didn't bloody fit. And you could either get a job in a hotel living in those days, and I thought, men wanted for circus. So right, this is where I go. So I head up to Chipping Norton. Uh, when I left the circus, I was in Cricklewood, and I ran out of money, so I ended up uh, on the streets. And I was in Shepherd's Bush Green, and with all the other dossers. Suddenly the bloody fraud squad came in. Not the fraud squad, the CID came in. Hello, son, what you got in your case then? And I opened it up, you've got this bloody chandelier and a hundred day clock. And, and, a, and a soda siphon as well, I don't know where I got that from. Reggie was at the bar and Ronnie was sitting down. And Frankie Fraser was in the corner, right? And the boyfriend. And Ronnie stands up, comes to me, goes, you want to the smudge then? I said, what do you want to do, Max? I said, I want to be an artist. He hmm, not possible. When you're forger, you don't do a Rembrandt and pop it into an auction room and say, look, I've got this smudge here, son, I think it's a Rembrandt. Nobody did those. You do lesser artists like Vickers, Samuel Palmer, two hours in the bloody bushes, because these were heavy dealers. I mean, I think they'd have, they'd have, they'd have done us some damage, so, so that wow. was close. Lots of things like that used to happen. There's thousand, a lot the fraud I don't know about. No. Here, oh my God! Did the fraud squad watch this program? When I walked into this room, the energy, the vibrant colours, the chi, just hit me right away, and it's just been so relaxing to come down towards Brighton and to meet Max, who is gone viral, millions of views on Vice Channel and huge thank you to Christian at KRN TV for arranging this interview and we are going to be publishing Max's book this year so if you're not familiar with Max the Art Forger we are about to take you on a journey <laughs> and we're also going to be looking at some of his works as well so Max huge thank you for you know no, spending yeah, time with us you. today it's my pleasure Welcome to my world. Indeed. Absolutely Don't worry about the decorations. They've been up for 11 years. I'll never take them down. <laughs> <laughs> Caravaggio's, Banksy's, all kinds in here. It is a um, Aladdin's palace. Beautiful. How did all this start, Max? I mean, how did you... Uh, what, from the very beginning? From the very beginning, When I yes. started, uh, like, I'll take you back to Buckingham Road, in, just near the Brighton Station, in a basement flat. And it was a basement flat with a front room, back bedroom, uh, a kitchen, we called it a scullery, and a larder. A that scullery. class was a fridge. Scullery, yeah, I've never heard of that one. An outside loo with a mangle. Everybody had a mangle. A mangle? A mangle is uh, when you rinse the clothes and you... Oh, dear. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> this is a... Well, this is we'll the, go back a bit. Yeah. Bit. A yeah. mangle was uh, when mum washed the clothes. We didn't have spin dryers. We didn't have a washing machine. It was done in a big tub with a big paddle. And then you'd ring it through <laughs> and mum would hang it and then she'd go onto the garden wall for the local gossip. And it was like, <laughs> think about that American character, uh, Les Dawson, over the garden wall. And mum would go, have any news, any gossip? And you go, yeah, Mrs. Russell's having it away with so-and-so. And you go, is she really? That's <laughs> awful. <laughs> and then mum would, mum would say, any gossip, mum? And that was it. So, but it was really, the poverty side was bad. Mm. It was um, five of us living there. What I years got, are we talking? Oh, 19, just after the, what we go, not, early 1950s, Sean. 1950s. I'm not going to give my age away now. <laughs> 1950s. And my sister, I've got a half-sister who passed away, bless her. And I've got two, two half-brothers. And it was all in one room. My sister had a curtain to cover where she had, but it was a tiny room. And, it, and I didn't, another thing is that we never, I didn't go to school. I didn't go because only one of us have had shoes and we had to choose who wore the shoes, even though they didn't bloody fit. Were you all the same size then? <laughs> no, <laughs> no, it didn't matter. <laughs> if you didn't have the right size shoe, well, it's hard luck, mate. I, I was the favourite because I was the youngest. Like my mum was a Yorkshire from Gisborough and she was, uh, she was lovely, my bless her. She was strong, very tiny, but she, she was, you know, my father, I'll tell you about my father in a minute. And, uh, but it was, 
food was scarce. I mean, I thought one day luxury was Weetabix in water. I thought that's the norm. Mm. And that was, a, that was a luxury. And bread and dripping and bread and margarine with sugar. That was unbelievable. I used to have a sugar. weird thing about toast with sugar on. Mm. Margarine and sugar. Well, this is all we had. Yeah. And I remember somebody coming in with a massive great tin of chocolate spread. And it was, and it was from the war, for Christ's sake. And it's, we had that, we had that every day for, for for months. Anyway, we didn't go to school, and uh, I think it got to a time. Uh, there's a place called Warren Farm. It's a workhouse, and they decided that you will have to go there. So the three of us, my sister went to a convent, and we went up to a workhouse, and it was called Warren Farm. It's in just outside of Winningdean. And it was, that was difficult, you know, I mean, it really was. Um, Mum used to visit on benches and she'd bring a brown paper bag, paper bag with all our bits in. And uh, then we went back and forwards until such times. I remember this day when, um, oh, it came to a time when uh, food was scarce. There, there was no national assistance in those days. It was the church that used to go, get mums to go down for a one pound ten shillings, which is old money. And um, we couldn't afford the coal, no heating, just a coal fire in mum's front room. And, um, but so uh, one day we were all there and uh, it was bad. So these two, a guy came down, looked like a par keeper. And a lady looked something out of the 40s, you know, with a grey coat on. She went, and then mum said, mum, and he said, hello, Mrs. Harris. I, I'll tell you more about that story. He said, uh, can I see the boys? And we were all in the other room in rags. We, I mean, we had spuds, a spud in the sock is a hole in your sock. It's an old <laughs> expression. If, if you went to school, you've got a spud in your sock. So we were, we were brought in and he said, uh, boys, you're going away with us to be looked after. My mum was crying and, uh, you know, because we'd been taken away. So uh, an old Morris Minor turned up. That was Mrs. Gibson, Mr. Odin and Mrs. Gibson. And she, she came down with his clothes. We'd never seen new clothes before. They were all grey, like short grey trousers, jump, and we couldn't believe it. Because we were in rags, we were in rags, you know. Um, and so, and then we were in this van, and, and Mum was, you know, crying at the door, and all the neighbours around. Suddenly, we whisked away to a place called Barkinside in Essex, the village-owned Barkinside. So we ride there with Mrs Gibson. We, Mr Castle came in. I said, hello, boys. He said, Max, you're going to Joy Cottage and Tony's going to Honeythorn. I said, why is that, sir? He said, because you wet the bed. I went, no, I don't. He said, yes, you do. So I went into this home and all these boys were there and went, you wet the bed, don't you? I went, no, I don't. He said, you wouldn't be here if you didn't. <laughs> but I tell you, Jen, their cure... The first night, because I pissed the bed, I pissed the bed for, for another two weeks. Wow. And she, they said to me, the cure was, if you can keep dry for seven days, you go to another cottage. And I kept dry for six days. Because you used to have a guy who'd come round and take you out of bed, right, and put, go to the, the wet bed, you know, to stop them pissing the bed. And I thought, oh, God, I'm six days tomorrow. And then, bugger me, I pissed the bed that <laughs> I was so excited. Oh, how unlucky. And then, no, but this is the good thing about it. Next door, a guy called Jackie Rainbird. And I thought, God, his cheeks are dry. So I swapped them over. Oh. <laughs> and Brilliant. So when he came back, he went, oh. I went, what? He said, I'm wet. I said, well, when you sleep, you don't know you've pissed the bed. And next morning, Ma'am Stanley came in. She went, good morning, boys. She, I know the way she used to get us out of bed. One, two, three, out and pull the bed back. So, and she went, Max, well done, you are kept dry. And then she said, well done, you can go and bro join your brother in Honeythorn. She goes to Jackie Rainbow, you dirty little boy. <laughs> and he's going, I, I didn't, I didn't, ma'am, honestly I was dry. She said, what is that, scotch mist? She said, <laughs> <laughs> so, so anyway, so he was, <laughs> he had, you know, he had to go down to the, in front of the <laughs> village, because it's a big village home, and wash his sheets in cold water in the tub. Oh. That was human, and so it stopped you. So I, I went to Honeythorn, cheating my way through that. <laughs> then, then we were moved to different places. We went, uh, we were there for uh, about about a year. Then they moved us on to Watson Naval Training School. 
oh, that was a massive great big Victorian building in Norfolk, you know. It was, it was a training school. As you walked in, there was this massive um, ship's mast, HMS Woodlock. They used to train the sailors on it, you know, the old clipper ships, you know. And it, but it was a Bernardo's when we walked in, and the first everything was run on the military side. You know, you know they had a bugle in the morning, and um, we we had the parade, and then the bugle would go for lunch. You know, you come to the cookhouse door, boy, lights out, last post. You know, and uh, I walked in. I was six years old, right? And I went, oi, come here. And this is a all all big tables with different boys. He was the prefect. He went. His name was Bartlett. And he went, oi, you're the grog boy. I went, what's that, sir? What's that? He said, tea. Go and, and, and I had to go and get the tea urn uh, and, and uh, give them all tea. I couldn't finish my meal until they, I couldn't eat until they'd finished. And I used, and that's it. But it was a tough, tough, you know. There were things like uh, diggy eye, the match that somebody's coming, or um, you're up stick, or you're a waggy, that means you're jealous. But everything was run on a military basis. There were three, three, four rooms. There was Lincoln, Cooper, Townsend and Baldwin. I was in Lincoln. And one year, I'm going to tell you this story, uh, they took us to camp. And we camped up in um, Sheringham. And, uh, and it was, a, it was under, under canvas. And one day the boy, I was a little cheat, I was cheating because it was survival. And he went, boys, he said, you're all going for a run today. You're going up to a place called Beast and Bum. I think it's a bloody great hill he showed us. He said, now the first one up there will get 10 shillings. Oh, God almighty. And there were all these different houses. They were red, green and blue. They all started off thinking, sure, I'm not going to do that hill. So what I did, I stood down. I got in the bushes at the bottom, right? And then I watched them all come on the top. I saw green, red and blue coming down. And just as they were about 200 yards away, I shot out these bushes. <laughs> and I went, and I'm not known, my masters knew I was no bloody sportsman. They went, well done, Brandrit. They never called you by your first name, by the way. Come on, Brandit. I heard one say, I didn't think Brandit was very sporty. Look at him go. <laughs> so I went, I went. He went, well done, Brandon. <laughs> and all my friends said, I didn't see you up there, Max. What's wrong? Where'd you do that? And that were the little tricks. You became incredibly streetwise, you know. And Agile. Like, yeah. So I did, um, I, you know, I did Watts Naval Training School. Then I, um, oh, I was boarded out to uh, the Reverend Soden. I genuinely love this because this was the Reverend Soden. Um, we, Mrs. Gibson said, you're going to be fostered up by the Reverend Soden in Barsham Rectory, which we, and we drove there and it was beautiful. It's an Anglo-Saxon church with a rectory, which now the interesting thing, Nelson's mother was born there, Mary Suckling, and also the five cavaliers hidden in a priest hole there. And I loved it there. It was such atmosphere. And the Reverend Soda and his, his pipe tobacco used to smell beautifully, you know. And I really did enjoy it there. And uh, we were there for, um, I think about a year. And then we moved on to Goldings, and uh, Goldings was my last port of call. And I remember the master said to me, Max, he said, so what do you want to do when you leave here? I was getting up, to, I don't forget I'd done so much before, I was getting up to 15. And I said, he said, do you want to go into boot making? I said, I don't want really to be a bloody cobbler. <laughs> or, or, or gardening, I went, yeah, whatever. Or printing, no, I don't think so. He said, what do you want to do, Max? I said, I want to be an artist. I went, hmm, not possible. So anyway, but my brother had already left because he was older than me and I had to stay another year, you know. So and, um, and I remember the day he came to his office, he said, Max, oh, no, Brandit, you're going home tomorrow. He said, so I want you to go out there and uh, be successful. Well, he didn't know I was going to be a forger, did he? I mean, I <laughs> just went out there. So that was it. So then I, then, uh, then I went back to my mother and my mother was living with an Irish called Patrick. Um, I don't, I'm nothing about the Irish, but just didn't like him. Instantly didn't like him. And uh, mum was living in Holland Road. And um, he didn't like me from the start. And uh, I think no, he, was, he used to get special treatment. So one night he beat me up because he thought I screwed the gas meter, which I didn't. My mum's my mom, my gas meter. So I ran away on a November night with 10 shillings in my pocket. Got on the train, stayed in the loo as you do. Played at the other ended up in bloody Paddington, and I was so good at putting my voice on acting. And I think I'm going to do the old trick. You know, I went, I got into this, lots of these funny guest houses. And he went, What do you want? You know, I said, uh, 
I need a room. I said I'm being picked up by six French nuns in the morning. <laughs> Why I said that, I haven't a clue. <laughs> he went, oh, so, I said, oh, yes, they're, they're coming with me tomorrow. He went, OK, so you can have a room. So he took me to this room, and I noticed this bloody gas meter in my thing. I, I screwed that for about how many shillings? Sixpences it was. Wow. So I did that. And then next morning, they're all at breakfast, so I screwed all the rest of them. I did five rooms. <laughs> <laughs> I walked out, and I couldn't even walk with his bloody sixpence in my pocket. <laughs> so he said to me, he went, all right, he said, I'm just going to meet the nuns. He said, OK, that's good. Well, well done. I called myself Harold Harris, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, so anyway, that was it. So I, I did feel guilty about that, you know, and I did so. <laughs> and then I thought, right, what do I do now? Hello. I looked in the Argus. I looked in the standard, was it the st standard? And it, you could either get a job in a hotel living in those days. And I thought, men wanted for circus. So, right, this is where I go. So I head up to Chipping Norton. And I arrived in Edna's Lane in Chipping Norton. I go out, don't forget, I'm about 16 then. And this guy comes out, a colour fella called Louie, and he goes, what do you want, son? I said, any job, sir? He said, uh, no. He said, how old are you? Uh, 16, he went, no, get back to school, son. So anyway, and I walked to him, he said, where are you going? I said, get a job in London. On, in the, he went, come here, you ever work with elephants? I went, no. So he took me into this tent with 12 of his elephants, all lined up, all chained up, and they're all, you know elephants, you know that we didn't know the cruelty about the, the animal training, because every elephant was either nodding and, uh, or up and down or sideways, because they're all chained, and that's 24-7 they're chained like that. Mm. Well, you didn't know that. And um, so Louis came in and he said, uh, he said, listen, Max, when they pull the big top down, Sean, it's tough work. No, I wasn't built for that. So he said, you'll be travelling with the elephants, right, on the bloody train with them, right? This is true. I did, this is in the book. And uh, the night of the pull, the pull the big top down at 10 o'clock, the, the Chipperfields family would come over to the, the elephants and they would unchain them. And all the elephants would link tails. Now, I would be back there with a dustbin on wheels looking like bloody Ben Hur, right? <laughs> so I'd be wheeling it down to the station. And the first night we got, it was in um, Dudley. And we got to the, the railway, the, the luggage, uh, you know, the, what do they call it? The, where they unload it, the goods yard. Yes. And there were two carriages and the elephants were pushed in. And uh, there was two and then there was six, uh, like 12 elephants, were six in each. And he went, go on, lad and I had to crawl underneath with these elephants moving around and chain their leg to the side. And those, those buggers, <coughs> didn't know, they knew you were there, but somehow they didn't care sometimes. Don't forget, they didn't know me that well as well. And then you'd chain them up, and then Dickie would give, would give me 10 shillings, and then I'd have my little walking stick. I had six camels to feed, plus the elephants. And I had my bucket, my, uh, my uh, dustbin on wheels. I had to go and find water, you know, if you know those things used to, in the old steam thing used to put the water down, then go back, the doors of the things would open, the trunks would come out, they'd suck it all up. You had to keep going back and forward still. And when you knew they'd finished drinking, they used to spurt it at you. <laughs> <laughs> so then I had to go and sleep in the goods wagon, the hay wagon, and I also had seven bloody camels, which I hated. They hated me and I hated them because every time they saw me, they used to spit at me and they could spit at a distance. They used to bring up their stomach contents and, and they would go for you, you know. Man, and then the next morning, you'd arrive at wherever, say you went from Dudley to Warrington, uh, the circus would start from there. So all the, all the girls and all that would, would come down and, uh, and the circus would go through the town, you know. What kind of acts were in the circus back then? Oh, um, there were trapeze, clowns, and, uh, oh, you know, um, yeah. Um, strong man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, strong man. Um, blowing fire and all that. And also, um, <clears throat> uh, what else was it? Oh, the girls, you know, riding the elephants. But the thing is, those elephants, they got so used to me, and I loved them. Oh. The, if you ever get to it, when, when they get to know you, mind you, Sally was dangerous. If Sally could get you, she would, you know. But Lelia, Lelia, Mary, Cameron, and Susie, and oh, Dana. Now, this is a, I don't know if you know this story, but uh, one day Louis said to me, the, the show was going on. We were in, um, I think we were still in Dudley at that time. <clears throat> he went, mate, let's have a look at your uh, arm. He went, yeah, that's all right. He said, um, all right, back of the water, please, hot, and lots of soap. He went, right, do what I do. 
So he got outside, Lelia was first, and he went, right, he said, do this. And he put his hand up the backside and pulled all the crap down. What? Pulled all the rubbish, all the, all the, all the poo down. And, I, and I, he said, you do the same. Oh. Right. Now I said, so I've got to do a whole bloody 12. He went, yeah, twice, twice a day, my hand up the elephant's backside. I said, Did you have gloves on? No, no, they didn't. Is, is like that it, because they have constipation, or is it just something that? No, yeah. they no, we they didn't want them um, pooping in the ring because it oh. ruined the act. Oh, of course. They, you know, because you never saw them in the ring. I mean, it was very unsightly. I mean, when they drop a cannonball, I mean, they're massive. <laughs> <laughs> so they would take out about probably, you know, uh, well, we had a little but side business. We used to sell bloody manure. You know, wow. but one Side day hustle. we tried to up the ante. We weren't getting enough crap on them. So this goon got bloody centipods and mixed it with their feed and they had diarrhea for a week. Oh. <laughs> yeah. So our business went up the spout then. Oh. <laughs> yeah. It, it was, uh, yeah, we did that. Yeah, it was, uh, but Lelia, when I was doing this raking them out twice a day, uh, afternoon show, evening show, and I noticed that Lelia and Mary both had their legs open before you got there. They loved it. They absolutely <laughs> they loved, loved it. it. Oh you God. go, Lelia, hold still, hold still. But don't let them cross their legs or you lose your bloody arm, for Christ's sake. Wow. Oh, really? Oh, Powerful. yeah. Don't let them squeeze. So no. strong. I mean, you've got, you'll probably get sucked into it. <laughs> 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 God. Sorry about that. You delete that one. Do you have to be trained in, like... Security measures around these animals because they're so strong. Like, did you have precautions? Yeah. No, well, all was we it instinctive had, uh, for you? No, no, they were chained up anyway. Yeah. But on the circus, everybody had a different sort of job, you know. You didn't do normal hours. You'd get up in the morning about nine and you'd worked, you know, you went seven days a week, you know. But when I left, I left after a long time there, I became very, very well liked because I was very handy. Dickie Chipperfield saw me drawing one day and painting and he said, can you do that on the side of the trucks? You know, the clout, of course I could do that and sign writing. So I became part of the family, you know, because the Chipperfield's family were very close knit. We didn't mix with the stars and the, and the ring grooms wouldn't mix with, with, with the, you know, with the elite, you know, they wouldn't. So anyway, but... Uh, it, it, it was a good life and I'd had enough of it. So I decided, I said to Dickie, they were heartbroken when I left because I was very useful. I, I did all the uh, menagerie. You know, when the circus finishes at night, they used to open the zoo part so you could go in and see the animals, you know. You'd, they'd go in front and the elephants would have a, a, you know, a rope in front of them. And, um, but I could do the menagerie, the elephants, the tigers. And I think I'd, after two years, I'd had enough, Jen. So I decided, I said, Dickie, I'm, I'm leaving. And I, but I thought, I'm heading to London. I really wanted to paint. But before, how, how old were you at that point? I was um, uh, 18. And I arrived in London. And um, I, I think, what did I do? Oh, yeah, before that, I saw it was Christmas time. And I saw the show, Bertram Mills was the Christmas show. So I applied there, and because I was quite, and I was quite pretty looking, to be honest. Yeah. Oh, I was, oh yeah. I looked I'm like, I don't know, I looked like Jesus, to be honest. So he looked at me and he went, yeah, he said, you're quite pleasant looking chap. He said, uh, you'll be a flunky. Now, you know what a flunky is? Like a no. Queen's footman. Well, the outfit, you were on the ring, on the ring side, they got a ring fence. And my job was to open up the ring fence and let the axe in and close it when they've gone. So the outfit with the changing room was a, a wing collar, a white bow tie, and um, white gloves, a big gold and red embroidered jacket, uh, knee breeches and stockings and buckled shoes and white gloves. Right, now my job and looking good on the side, there were four of us, right? Didn't have any ugly ones on there with a couple of Italians doing it. The ex used to come in like the horses, you'd pull it back, and then Rogana and that sort of thing. But the, what, what really um, was um, quite, well, it wasn't nasty, it was quite amusing. A new act turned up called the Primalettis, and they were a bloody uh, knife-throwing act. Well, I didn't, they couldn't speak any damned English. So what I didn't know, he said, you know what to do? Yeah, nice, yeah, I went, yeah, okay, no problem. So what it is, the, a, a, a target would be brought in, she'd be strapped to it, and they used to spin it around, and he'd go boom, boom, boom with his knives. Well, unbeknown to me, he put petrol and set the buggers alight. So when I, he said, my job was to take the knives out. So I took the knives out and I was blowing and I caught my hair was alight. Oh my God. So I was running around with my gloves alight from the, the surplus sort of uh, thing. But Hattie Jakes was in the audience with John Lemizier. 
and they thought it was part of the bloody act, but I had third degree burns. I ended up in Hammersmith Hospital for, for two weeks. Oh my God. She came to see me, Hattie Jakes, because I'd lost a lot of hair, you know. So there was some of the dangers, and, and uh, anyway, I had a lot of that. I was going to ask if there were many accidents. Hmm? I was going to ask if there were many oh, accidents. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Was, uh, yeah Carlos Rosés, I saw, I was there when she fell off the trapeze and she, she, she hit the safety net, she rolled off. So she hit the side in the fencing, you know. With the well, lions and tigers? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. What was, how did the handlers of them behave? Oh, well, well, I'll tell you what, it was such a cheat because um, so, most of the lions didn't have any teeth anyway. <laughs> <laughs> no, they didn't, no. Aww. I mean, I'll tell you one day there was... Um, uh, when the ti Yvonne from Holland with her, with her tigers and her lions, and they'd had the ring, they'd have a, a, a big, obviously for security, a big high uh, fencing grid, and they would have a tunnel of grid, and they would come out the beast truck down the tunnel. Well, this guy was so keen to get away to see his girlfriend, he dismantled the tunnel just as one of the lions was coming through. So it came back in the audience, oh, and it all scattered, no. and the beast man came with his blanks and shot. It didn't shoot it, shoots blanks at it to keep to, to control it. Wow. So many things, yeah, little things. Were there little people or bearded ladies, anything like that? Uh, yeah, there was, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah the bearded out. No, that was, uh, yeah, that, that wasn't real. No, but there was one act which we knew was fake, and it was uh, Zyra swims with the crocodiles and swims with the pythons. Well, Lelia was, was the star of the show to me. Le and she used to bring in a, a great big glass tank, you know, full of what, you know, big, and Zyra, and they'd place a crocodile in it, an alligator in it, and then a python would go in it, and she would have a sort of gold bikini and dive in and pretend to wrestle. Well, we knew the bloody hell that couldn't open his mouth because it was taped up with cat gut, you know. <laughs> so it was all those fakes, you know. <laughs> Did the crocodile have teeth? Oh, I think so. Well, <laughs> yeah, I think so. I mean, yeah. but uh, but yeah, there was uh, there was so much fate going on there, you know. But uh, I enjoyed it. I loved it. I loved it. But um, you know, some good days there, and, right? And you said that you you were already being recognised for your art at this point. Uh, recognised. Um, what, from who? Oh, only from Chibberfields. Yeah. I but, hadn't, but, I hadn't what, hit the forgery what, what yet. What got you interested in art then, in the beginning? Oh, uh, oh I think... At that during, young age. I, I think from a, an, when I was in living with mum, I was always, you know, instead of playing cowboys and Indians with the other boys, I was drawing cartoons like Mickey mm. Mouse and Pluto and all that sort of thing. And I used to... Sp mum... In mum's, uh, in that basement flat, we had a big cupboard, a long cupboard, and I used to sort of like go in there for hours just drawing and drawing, you know. And I'll tell you what, my brother was a little snide actually. I started to notice little women, you know what I'm saying? Mm. And he used to sort of open the door and go, Mum, Max is doing dirty pictures again. I went, bugger off. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, that was all good. So, and, what uh, was your next career move then? Yeah. Uh, down to forgeries, wasn't it? Oh no, before that, there was one interesting story actually. Uh, when I left the circus, I was in Cricklewood and I ran out of money, so I ended up uh, on the streets. And I was in Shepherd's Bush Green and with all the other dossers. And that's just when I learned how to sort of, because uh, I was very young, you could go to a place called Cadby Hall and get a night's work. And because I was sort of young and they were all dossers, and they'd say, they took me under their wing, you know. So you'd, you'd line up like you do, and they'd pick you out for a job. And they go, yeah, you, you, and you for a night's work. And they used to push me in the front and say, the lad needs a job. All right, son. All right, son. And I was on the bloody donut machine, <laughs> injecting jam into donuts all night. <laughs> <laughs> what it was, Jane, it was that the donuts were down the conveyor belt. You get your donut, you'd stick it in this tube, then you go boom, and the donut was, was spurt out. <laughs> then I'd go on the winkly machine, and the winkly on the rolls, and uh, yeah. But you'd only get, you'd only probably get one night, and um, probably in two weeks. So, so when they, they used to say, Max, I said, Do you know what? I should go back to the bakery tonight and just put a brown coat on and start nicking stuff. And they went, Yeah, go on, Max. You could, they won't notice you, you know. So I went there and, and got a brown coat and started walking around. Nicking the bread, malt, loaves, butter, cheese, taking the back. They were loving it. And one night, um, I got caught and he went, Oi, Max, what are you doing here? I went, uh, well, I said, I, I, was, I was just... Uh, he went, go on, Max. 
and I couldn't get any food. But on the way out, I noticed this bloody van opened a wedding cake in it. So I nicked the top of the wedding cake off it with the bride and groom still on it. <laughs> <laughs> so I got, got to, back to the old dossers and went, what'd you get, Max? I went, bloody wedding cake. <laughs> they're, all, they're all sick of wedding cake. <laughs> no, uh, but they were good to me. And that's when I got a few bob. Uh, I don't know how I managed to get a, a, a place in, uh, I think I was in Cricklewood. And I started painting. And suddenly I thought, I'm going to go start painting shipping scenes on old canvas. And that's the first time I met Tom Keating. We were in Club Row. We were arguing over a set of canvases. I, I didn't like him that much anyway. You know, he, you know, he wasn't very friendly. But uh, so this is when I started faking pictures and doing shipping scenes. And this is where my whole career started. Because I honestly, Jen, I could actually paint almost any subject, didn't matter. Yeah. So I thought, right, go to Portobello Road. Got my guitar out for it, no couple of songs, well, I only knew two. So I sort of put a blanket down and stood there, right, you know, and don't know, it's a long and dusty road. And I, <laughs> God, this bloody bloke sing the same fucking songs every, every, every Saturday. So anyway, uh, and the paintings, and then uh, I'll tell you before I met Sammy Cohen, was my, almost like my father figure. Um, we bought that fire together, by the way. Mm. It's very, anyway. very vintage, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. So uh, one day, the guy looking very nice, sort of like suited and booted, and he went, where would you get the painting from, kid, son? I went, oh, just buy them. He went, are you much selling that shipping? So 150 quid, so that's a bit of quality there. And he went, see, where did you get it? I said, I paint. And he went, no, really? Do you really paint these? That's how I met Sammy Cohen. This is how we started in the forgery business. Wow. So, you know, this is how it got really into the big stuff, you know. Um, you know, do you want to know the, the how we oh, the yes. auction side? Yes, it? please. Yeah, right. So uh, we used to sort of uh, do nice. Uh, I was in Cricklewood again. Then we'd do nice shipping scene. See, the difference is when you're a forger, you don't do a Rembrandt and pop it into an auction room and say, "Look, I've got this smudge here, son. I think it's a Rembrandt." Nobody did those. You do lesser artists like Vickers, Samuel Palmer. Uh, or um, any or Jonathan Chrome, um, and do lesser artists that make two or three grand, right? So I did, um, I did what I call well. You'll get another story of this, called Albert Darby, right? Now, first of all, the painting would be right, it'd be cracked on that fire with the aging, it'd be perfect under glass, and you'd go to an auction room with Sammy was a, we'd go as, as father and son. Like, hello, Dad, all right, sort of thing. <laughs> and you walk in there and you go, excuse me, sir. You go, and as you call him, sir, and you would make sure that he's showing respect. And you go, yes, got a couple of smudges, sir. Do you have a look? He goes, smudges? Like painting, sir. Got paintings. And what we used to do, Jen, we used to do a lot of pot boilers, like rubbish, and throw in a couple of goodies, right? And like a nice, a nice Henry Vickers or something. Oh, a bit like Turner shipping off Dover or whatever. And he'd go, you'd go, he'd go for the rubbish and go, what's that on the floor there? Oh, what, the one with the boats on it, sir? Dad, pick that up, right? It's lovely. And he'd pick it up, he'd go, yeah, it's quite interesting. You go, what's that about then, sir? He said, it's, uh, it's Albert Darby. Is he any good, sir? <laughs> it was a game. <laughs> and we go, so, and then he would stop me, Sammy, and he'd go, you see, son, this gentleman knows his business. He studied all this. And we go, yes, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> it's, good. it's good. And you go, do you wish to put this, oh, whatever you say, sir. I said, tell me about it. He said, well, it's possibly Norwich School. Was it painted in Norwich, sir? No, 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 it's Norwich School of Art. So you really, and what you had to do, Jen, is to keep their mind off what they're looking at. And then you'd go into the auction room and you'd ring it. You're not ringing this, don't you? Yeah, we bid it up. Yeah. Yeah, and we did that for quite a few, quite a lot of time. That was it. <laughs> All right. What a good hustle. Yeah. Where did you source your materials from to make such quality forgeries? Uh, old canvases from London. In the 60s, 60, 67, 68, you could get them anywhere. So cheap, honestly, Sean. You could buy them for about a pound. And uh, I'll tell you what, one day I came across an absolute gem. The biggest hit of my life it was. It was an oval frame. And it was oval with a beautiful, beautiful frame. What we call a sweat back. That's called a sweat back. And I did, and, and uh, Sammy said, what do you want? I said, I can see a Dutch winter scene on it. He said, I can. I can see a Dutch winter scene with I was good at those. 
and we did it and it looked the business you know the building at the side the skating figures we got it up to auction then i thought my god i'm done you have to bid on this one i'm not bidding it up it just went up eight nine ten grand i thought god what a day what a day you know and uh, but I, did, I must admit there was one time i did feel a bit guilty um one of the pictures we started bidding for it and i uh, remember this guy a persian guy came over to me and said I'm so sorry, my friend, you did not get the picture. I said, well, go, you win some, you lose some. And just we just stitched them up for five and a half grand. Wow. <laughs> the, what about the colours then? How do you create the colours? This is where, one, Sean, I'm not saying, it's one thing I'm, I've always been pretty good at. If I can see, if you look at the Caravaggio there, you know, and um, you'll see that I've, I've got this knack of reproducing, you know, any colours, you know. Yeah. And uh, if you look at, at the Coolidge, the Coolidge one, I've got sort of, um, uh, I've got the colours dead right. I mean, I said to, I said to, to, to um, I said to, uh, to, I can't remember what I just said then. Yeah, I was just telling everybody, if, if that was on old canvas, I could get away with that. I yeah. really could. That is spot on, that one. I won't sell it, though. No. It's sitting there going in our book, won't it, John? Yes, mm -hmm. <laughs> on the cover. Yeah. Book's going to be good, isn't it? It is, absolutely. I love the one behind your head with Goofy. Do you? Yeah. That's a Wyland. He's an American artist. Oh, really? I don't rate that. No? No. Who no. is your favourite artist to oh, forge? Oh, Coolidge. Or Definitely. Coolidge. I, yeah, I mean, I love that. I mean, I love the old masters, you know, but uh, that's not a bad copy, I mean. That's brilliant. I spent about three weeks on that. So early on then, where were you sourcing your colours? Uh, oh, anywhere. I mean, you know, didn't, I mean, oh, there is a, there is a trick, actually, um... Uh, as if you use oil, you you actually um, they take a long time to dry. All this rubbish about linseed oil, it doesn't. I mean, we were turning out sort of these fakes, sort of maybe three a week. There is a secret, and um, you take ordinary braillac undercoat white, which you do for a door, mix that with your colours. That will dry in about fifteen twenty minutes. But I'll tell you a story. I was with Sammy Cohen. We were in Arundel. And uh, we were, you know, knocking out a few to the dealers up there. So we go in this shop. Sammy's in one place, I'm in the other. And the bugger didn't test them. He came running into me. I'd already sold my picture for, for 800 quid. And he came running at me and he went, Max, get out. And it was all fast. So I thought, oh shit, I've got his money and I've still got the painting. So I start running. He's only got the painting next door. He's sussed it out because the paint's still bloody wet on it. <gasps> it came off in his finger. We were running down Har <sighs> Arundel High Street. We couldn't find a bloody car. So we hid in the bushes for, for nearly two hours in the bloody bushes because these were heavy dealers. I mean, I think they'd have, I'd have, we'd have, we'd have done us some damage. So, so that wow. was close. Lots of things like that used to happen. Close to shaves. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We would get in the car in the old Volkswagen and say, where should we go? Uh, let's go up Norfolk, you know, and uh, we do the same old thing. And I'll tell you another thing, which is, uh, it's in the book. Uh, Albert Darby didn't exist. He was made up. He used to sweep the rooms in a, in a, in a guest, in a, in a, a warehouse in Brighton. So this dealer thought that Sam, um, um, Albert Darby was the real deal. Mm -hmm. He thought they were real. Wow. There you go then. How big did it get with these forgeries? Mm. Well, quite, well, I got nicked enough on it. How many times have you been nicked? So, three, three times. How many years were you doing it for then? Oh, oh, a long time. I was lucky. I mean, you know, the frauds got, I mean, God, they knew all about me, didn't they? But the first time I went in Nick, <coughs> when... <coughs> How old? Oh, God, I was 16. Uh, I was in, I was dossing. I ended up in Dorchester and... Um, I'd, I sort of, you know, I ended up uh, sleeping on, in the wagon, in, in the uh, train wagon. And one morning I thought, I was in, I thought, walked up the high street, it was like five in the morning, starving hungry, and I saw this guest house. And it, because in those days you just walk in, there was no porter. So I walked in and I saw this bloody chandelier. I thought, I'll have that way. So I took the chandelier and a hundred day clock and I wheeled it down the high street on the barrow. So, so I got into the station and uh, I put it in my case and I, Unfortunately, it was some big male sort of uh, uh, assistant on the station in the left luggage. He thought it was something to do with bloody train robbery or something. <laughs> he did. He had those sorts of visions. So, so I'm having a cup of tea and because this lady went, do you want a cup of tea, love? I said, well, I haven't got any money. Don't. She said, have a breakfast. Suddenly, the bloody fraud squad came in. Not the fraud squad, the CID came in. Hello, son. What you got in your case then? 
and I opened it up, you've got this bloody chandelier and a hundred day clock and, and, a, and a soda siphon as well. I don't know where I got that from. So he takes me to the station. I re, uh, came up in court. I refused to give my name and address. So they gave me three months for, and Dorchester. But when you get in there and they find out you can draw, yeah, you, got, you know what yeah. happens then. You then they want pictures with the girlfriends exactly. and the wives, and yeah, on, even on the envelopes, you got yeah. your roses getting drawn. Ro and all, oh yeah, then yeah, what? and uh, yeah, I became a tobacco baron, you know, because there's so many drawings that I was doing, and you know, can you do a picture of my dog and all that? See, I had a, I had a minder called McGinty. He used to go and collect my tobacco on a Friday, and uh, but you respected. You know, I started painting. I went to the governor. I didn't. I was banged up first of all with three others. I, a guy from Curacao, who was a who was a stowaway, and two guys who got got done for watering down paraffin for the old pensioners. So Ooh. then I got banged up on my own, and I loved it. You know, yeah. and I stopped them giving me bloody bromide, which I didn't like. You know, what bromide does, don't you? No. Oh right. What, what it does reduces it? your sexual powers in the evening. Mm. It's a tablet they give you. You didn't have them, did you? No. no. I mean, <laughs> no. Are they still legal. Oh, it is, yeah. Still around. Well, otherwise you'd get them climbing up the bloody wall, wouldn't you? Mm. <laughs> yeah. But you know what? As you know, um, you're respected. Um, the, the sort of it was old slop out days. You, you know, that was the days when you had a, a pot in your in your thing, and and they go open the doors in the morning, slop out, go down, wash your basin, come round down to breakfast. Breakfast was on a tin tray. Everything was there, and and you know, yeah. So I did that, but. Uh, that was the first time, but so I've done Dorchester, I've done Winchester, but mine were only minors, you know, I did uh, my last one. Oh, my last one in what, court. What, what was the second one for first? What was oh, that, that was for forgeries, that was knocking How out. did they catch you? Yeah. Uh, a greedy dealer called Otto from, from Germany. I gave, I gave him two Samuel Palmers and he tried to sell him in the same bloody gallery and they started to sort of like suss it out and then he picked me up in Cricklewood and they got there and I've still got one on the bloody easel. <laughs> so he went, what's that? I said, I don't know, I'd never seen it before and no, I didn't. So I got nicked on that one. What's the actual charge? Yeah. Um, fraud. Fraud. Because I, I hit the gallery, didn't I? Yeah. For about a grand, I think. Oh, was it a grand? Two grand, actually. Yeah. Right. And how serious is that an offence? Pretty good. Pretty is. Fraud yeah, sounds you're, quite... It's quite... embezzlement of fraud yeah. and deception, isn't it? So and, what, uh, what, what kind of a sentence were you looking oh, at? Oh, about 18 on months. One? 18 months. Yeah. My last time I was banged to rights guilty and I was in Lewis Crown. And uh, my brief said to me, you know, I paid him enough. He said, Max, the jury out, you're going to walk. I went... Oh great! So we all went over to the to the pub and had a wine there in in the White Hart. So I'm sitting there and I had two bottles of wine. The, the foreman came out and said, "Jury are back." I said, "Darling, put that in the fridge for us. Well, I'll be back in ten minutes. I've got bloody eighteen months for Christ's sake." So oh. I went. I went back, Jen, for my wine. I went. Can I have my wine? She said, "What?" I said, "I left." It said when? I said, oh, "About eleven months ago." With the <laughs> <laughs> so she said, "We don't normally keep wine that long." <laughs> <laughs> Did they at least give you a free glass? Yeah, yeah right. lots of little things like that. But uh, do you know I was even forging in Nick? Right, mm. from the Nick? Yeah. What, sending it off? No, 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 no. We had a little trick. Sammy came and visit me, right? Because he didn't get nicked, I did. So I was in, um, I was in Dorchester, actually. And he came up to me and he went, fancy doing any work? I couldn't do any work here, for God's sake. I went, no, he said, a few little penny and inks, Samuel Palmer's, you know. So what he had up his sleeve was six rolls of uh, rolled up old paper that he nicked from the library. He used to go to the library and raise a blade so the old phrases of these old books, especially punch, old punch albums. So you'd go and you'd go, and, and then you had contact with people, right? It was no bar or anything. And you'd go, all right, son, now keep your head down, right? And then he'd, he'd slip it out there and it would go up your sleeve, right? From his sleeve to mine. And then you'd push it up and you'd go, right, okay, right. Leave, sir. All right. And he'd go and I would go there. I asked for a bigger Bible. My, my, this, the uh, warden thought it was a bit sus suspect. So I had a bigger Bible, flatten them all in, pen and ink drawings of Samuel Palmer's and that. Uh, did you do that from memory then? Or did you have to copy no, it from I something? No, I had some reference books. Uh, you had a reference book you know from the library? Palmer, uh, yeah. Gotcha. Samuel Palmer does um, drawings of old churches, pen mm. and ink drawings. Well, he was a, but we used to do these and... Yeah, we got those off to a T, you know. Yeah, I can yeah imagine. bloody right. There's a few on my somebody's wall. Think, oh, I've got a few bob there. No, you haven't, son. <laughs> <laughs> I, 
I went to a place once and I saw one of my work. Yeah. Yeah. I've been to Arundel and I've seen one of my pictures. How, I, how high have they been bidded up? Uh, oh, I think I've done about 20 grand, something like that. 20 grand. I think more than that. Yeah. Who knows? Who knows where they've all gone to? Once, they, once they've left you, then yeah. they just go higher and higher, do they? Yeah. Until someone realises? Yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. And how many of them do you think just get through and are never realised? Oh, I think there's a few thou out there. There's a few thou. There's a lot the fraud there? squad don't know about. No. Yeah. Oh, my God. Do the fraud squad watch this programme? <laughs> <laughs> So do you think some of them could be worth like hundreds of thousands, millions by now if they've not been busted? Oh, I think they probably think they are. They think they are. Um, yeah. I mean, I mean, I was, I was, I could fake anything. I heard Tate's yeah. finding Louis, Louis Wayne, Louis Wayne was brilliant. Cats, you know the cats? Yes. Yeah. yeah. I used to do a lot of those. Do like, well, you can sell them, that. No. That's the sort of so Louis Wayne detail. image, isn't it? Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. If you have enjoyed this podcast, you will love max's book britain's number one art forger i have just listened to the audio book and i have laughed my ass off not only are the regional accents an absolute delight the anecdotes i mean max starts out working in the circus he's put in charge of the elephants one's constipated he's got to put his arm in to get the stuff out and he's almost getting bombed by these massive poos elephant poos which he then turns around because he's such a hustler and sells them to farmers as fertilizer that's just the beginning he's doing his paintings he's selling paintings to the cray twins and then he's going to the the galleries at the uh, auction houses where all, there's all these posh people and he's tricking them into buying these forgeries it's a absolute delight to behold it's available worldwide on amazon link is in the description box and what did you think of when you met max jen you had a little oh, tickle didn't you with him yeah little sherry <laughs> 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 yeah what, such an interesting interesting man so i can't wait to read or listen to this book should i say yeah the audiobook it's available worldwide on amazon paperback ebook but i especially recommend the audiobook so check it out cheers thanks for supporting the podcast thank you so when did you have your first introduction to the Cray Twins? Uh, I was busking in Portobello Road. And uh, I'd, actually, I'd met his boyfriend at um, uh, Green Park, you know, the railings. I had some paintings on there. And he came up to me and I didn't, didn't think about it. He went, oh, do you do paintings like I do smudges from photographs? And he said, where are you next week? I said, I'm at Portobello Road. So on this Saturday, he came down. He was all suited, but it was definitely his boyfriend. This is Reggie, went, is it? Huh? Reggie Cray's boyfriend. Ronnie. Ronnie's boyfriend, Ronnie, sorry, Ronnie. Ronnie. And he went, hello. So he said, I met you before. I said, do you do paintings and smudges? For and, and he said, hold on. He said, and he went away and he came back with a photograph of a woman about 50, 55. And uh, I said, I can do that. He said, will you have it ready for next week? I went, yeah, I'll do that. So... Did it, put it in a nice frame. It was like 2016. Looked good, looked good. So he came down, you got to smudge. And he said, yeah, I said, I've done it. He said, my friends are up the road in a place called the Earl of Lonsdale pub, right? So he walks up, I walk up behind him and he goes to a sidebar and I walk in, open the door and it's all dark, you know? And I think, and I thought, and immediately I, I recognised Reggie. Reggie was at the bar and Ronnie was sitting down. And Frankie Fraser was in the corner, right? and the boyfriend, and Ronnie stands up, comes to me, goes, you got the smudge then, kid, got it? I went, yes, sir, don't, don't call me, sir. Don't call me fucking, sir. Oh, sorry about that. Don't call me, sir. So anyway, he said, let's have a look. And he pulls the pincher out of the bag, uh, and it in a bloody bin liner, for gross sake. And he looks at it, and he went, went all quiet. I thought, oh my God, doesn't like it. And he went, Reggie, have a look at this, Reggie. Have a look at this, Reggie. It's mum, in it. He's got it, it's mum dead on, in it. You do this, son. I went, yes. Tried to stay not, sir. Have a look. And he kept looking at it. He said, bloody marvellous. Sit down, son. I sat between, no lie. Reggie there, Ronnie was there. I was in the middle. And they were, forget about Spandau Valley being sort of crazy. They didn't look anything like them. They were big. You used to wear big coats in those days, you know. Were well, they quite tall? Yeah, uh, no, no, they weren't actually, no. no. But they were thick set guys. Their suits made them look like the coat hanger in their jacket, you know. But... And, uh, and he sat and he said, uh, you really did this? And he said, uh, and, he, and Ronnie went, and he's a pretty looking kid as well, isn't he? I thought, oh, no. <laughs> That's cool. So he said, how much show you then? And I, went, I was going, well, he went, give him a two. I thought, two quid. It was 200 pounds in 1968. It was like giving you a thousand. What the hell? And Ronnie went to me, 
You must come and have tea with my mum in Valence Road. I went, no, sir, I've got to go to church, Mr. Cray. Of course. What were they like? Huh? What were the Cray twins like, really like? Were they uh, scary? Yeah, Ronnie was, I told you, Ronnie was, didn't blink. He had blink. to stare, yeah. He didn't, didn't blink, blink because he was so used to the lights, you know. And uh, But Reggie, Reggie was okay. Reggie was all right. But Ronnie did, but Ronnie was nice to me. You know, but uh, I think he took a shine to me because I was quite sort of like that, look, to his type, you know what I mean? He was so used to the lights in prison where they were never turned off. Was that, mm. was, was that yeah, what that's it right, is? yeah. Yeah, well, they didn't, did they? Wow. Well, for him, they didn't, because yeah. but they did for us because, you know, um, we were not escapees. But, mm. you know, in prison, I mean, if you were, if you're an escapee, you had a yellow stripe down the side of your trousers so they could see. But in my day the, the, the in nick was different it was really different you know mm. i mean we had slop outs and we had um uh, exercise we had a ken scene you know it was a tough long life but anyway so that's um that's uh it's all right isn't it this i this, i feel like i'm at home to be honest <laughs> <laughs> you know what i'm not even aware of you there jane sorry <laughs> <laughs> but i I'm love this this is the real me this yeah, yeah, yeah this is relaxed. the real that's me classic. You know, this is how I want to be, because my book is about survival. Mm. You know, all the stories, the bakeries and, and the people I met, the wet bedding, my mother as well, bless her, you know. Mm. And um, yeah, so. Uh, Who else did you meet then? Oh, I, oh, oh yeah. Uh, oh, I did my stint in Birmingham. I'm a great lover of Variety Club. I made a lot of money for Variety Club. Um, I did the Leicester Picket Fraud. Yeah, I'm going to give him much. I'll tell him that, shall I? Unless the picket fraud. What is that? Well, I was in a charity in London. I was. Uh, I met Tim Rice, and uh, he was chatting to me. I was in. I was with the. I was in what we call the uh, VIP room, and I was trying to get a sale from the Swedish ambassador. I asked him, "Do you like winter scenes?" Because <laughs> he said, "Not really." But Tim Rice was fascinated by my life story, and so I was on his table. And they were all drinking and a lot of faces were there, you know, a lot of uh, so-called celebrities came in. And, they, and I was sitting on my own and they were, they began to work. And this lady said, you do so much for Bernardo, what about doing something for us? And I went, who are you? She said, well, the Selly Oak Hospice. And I went, yeah. I said, I'll tell you what I'll do. I've just, um, which I'll give you some prints to take home today, by the way. Oh. Yeah. Anyway, so um, uh, I said, I'll tell you what I'll do. I've just done a horse uh, racing picture of Tenoso with Lester Pickett. I will get them signed by Lester Pickett. <laughs> so, so anyway, I said, that I'll do a hundred for you. So I rang Lester Pickett's agent and he wanted seven grand. I went, bugger you, mate. So I faked off a hundred signatures. So, so, but unbeknown to me, Susan Pickett was at a charity in Kent. She noticed one of these prints, but that's not my husband's signature. So I got banged to rights, got picked up oh. in Birmingham. And I remember the, the Mr. D.C. Blackwell, he said, uh, Max, he said, are, you the, are these yours? In the, as in the grill room, I went, yeah. He said, so you're admitting? I went, of course I am. I did it, I'm banged to rights, guilty. And he went, he went oh. and he liked me, he liked me. He said, Max, I don't want to nick you. You did it for charity, didn't you? But you did all sell though, I must admit. So when I was going out, the custody officer said to me, yeah, Max, can I have one of your sign prints? Would you want less to pick out or just me? <laughs> <laughs> How easy is it to fraud someone's signature? Oh, it's not. It's just trace it off. Really? That's why I met I met Jack Vitriani. Did the same thing. He had a book signing in Brighton. I said, he said, do you paint? I said, oh, I dabble a bit. <laughs> I said, <laughs> said could you sign that for me? I went, yeah, I've got his signature now. <laughs> 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 yeah. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so. Uh, and did you meet any uh, famous actors and actresses? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, oh yeah. Let's tell you about Canterbury. Yeah, tell you about Canterbury. I, um, I, I moved to Canterbury and I, I, I lived in a derelict pub. This is where I met Chris Ellis, right? And it was, I had the whole bar. All, all the bits had been taken up, but I slept behind the bar and I was known as the artist, the forger. I mean, ladies, girlfriends, ooh, they are unbelievable. Uh, yeah, could you just drop your top, darling? I'm just going <laughs> to... And I remember Chris, the first time I met Chris Ellis, he was uh, in the Marlowe Theatre doing uh, Chekhov's The Seagull. Mm. And he knocks on the door for a room. 
And he walks in, and uh, I've got a girl there topless sweeping the floor. And he goes, here, Max, why is she topless? I said, well, I've told her a jumper makes a lot of dust, and it gets on my canvas. <laughs> <laughs> so, that's how I met Chris Ellis. And uh, then we became great friends. And I, mm. I didn't see him till I got to a charity in... Um, in uh, Brighton, and I met him, and uh, like he was in the Bill Burnside, and I met uh, Joanne uh, uh, Edward Fox, who was married to Joanne Woodward. Yeah, I met a lot of celebrities. I did the. Uh, I went up to Birmingham. I met. I met Ollie Reed. Oh God, oh, that was a big Oh wow, he's a hellraiser. Oh, I His met Ollie Reed in a charity in the Roundhouse in Birmingham, and I uh, and I was giving uh, six horse prints framed. Right, and he bid, and he won the bid at a thousand pounds. And his agent said to him, "Do you want to come and meet Max, Max Brandy?" He said, "Don't make the fuck off." <laughs> I went, he went, "What?" I said, "It's Max, the one who bought the Prince. Don't make the fuck off." And uh, he went, no, "He's here." And so Ollie said, "Sorry about it. Sit down." And Ollie Reed had a um, uh, a cricket jacket on, big bold stripes cricket cap on, short trousers, and a big jug of gin and tonic, <laughs> pistols and you. <laughs> and he went, he went, sit down. He said, you're coming to Guernsey with me on my helicopter. And he said, see you in the morning at the Roundhouse Hotel. And he, well, he didn't get up till about three, but you realise, Jen, that when he's there, all his entourage, they're all going, egging him on to do these things. He got up. He didn't even bother going to the loo. He went, he went and pissed in the corner. Wow. That's how bad it was, yeah. Oh. And I, li I, li I liked him. <laughs> he rang me afterwards and he rang me. He said, I'm sorry about it. I couldn't go to Guernsey anyway, so. But yeah, that's, I did meet a few of them, yeah. Which of ones did you like? Uh, who did I like? Yeah. Uh, I love Ollie Reed. I definitely liked Tim Rice, you know, because he was such a keen cricketer as well. I did him a picture of a cricket picture. I did it for him. Yeah, I met some lovely characters. Any you know. famous uh, female stars back then? Oh, I went out with Anita Harris. Only a dinner date. She was, uh, <laughs> she was doing um, Peter Pan in Marlowe Theatre. Because I was doing scenic designing, you know. I just did all the scenes. Mm -hmm. I did a whole scene of Wind in the Willows on my own. Because the other guy couldn't paint. <laughs> he, he was the scenic director as well. <laughs> He <laughs> couldn't do it, you know, wind in the willows outside, you know, yeah. toe to toe all yeah, yeah, yeah. It's been a good old time. This is so natural for me, this is. Good. Yeah. So what do you think of Andy Warhol? He's probably one of my favourites. Andy Warhol? Oh, you mean the old cans of soup? Uh. Yeah, I'd never got, I'd love to have met him. I think, uh, I don't, I don't know, Jen, I just don't know. A bit quirky pop art, isn't oh, it? Oh, absolutely, yeah. yeah. I mean, I think Banksy would be quirky and interesting if you knew who he was. If you know. we knew. But, I, I, you know, what? I think they get so sort of uh, Banksy money-wise, but I know he's got, he's got issues as well. With, he's looking after the planet. I understand that. But someone like David Hurst, who wants millions and millions? I certainly don't want that. That skull, what was it? That's oh, yeah, diamonds diamond. full of it. Yeah. 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 And, and those spinny things, you know, those spin things. I, I just don't understand all that. Who do you think Banksy is? Don't know. It could be my ghost right there. there. <laughs> <laughs> is it you? It could be. Him. Yeah, it could be. Can him. you look at somebody's art and have an like an understanding of their personality type? Can you what? Can you look at someone's oh, art oh, yeah. and have an understanding look, of their, their personality art. type through through what they've drawn? Does it give you an insight into their psyche? Oh uh, yeah. Like if I look at someone's bookshelf and see what they read, I can understand a bit about that person. Yeah. Can you look at the art and ha have that same thing? Uh, look at my art? Or no, any anybody's art. Oh, I can, yeah. I yeah. can, yeah, I can. Yeah. 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 And what, what does the um, act of creating the art do for you, for your soul? Oh, uh, I, I love working. I'm not interested in the money side. Really, I'm not. I've got a couple of bob in the bank, which I've never had. I mean, look, you know the story of the faking ducks, don't you? Please tell the viewers. Oh, yes. The faking duck episode. <laughs> now, in this very chair, I sat here two and a half years ago, and not a penny in my pocket. And I saw, I had 12, no, 14 quid on me. And I thought, I saw this advert on, e, uh, on eBay, and it said, paint your own ducks. So I sent away for these set of ducks, and they were 
they were ceramic, they were dead right, they had the backing, they had they were hollow, they had the string on them as well, and they were, they were glazed white. So I painted them from the very colours of a Bezic duck, and I put them on eBay, and they went for, on the second night, they made 380 quid. I've just spent 12 quid on the box. So I ordered another 12 boxes. <laughs> <laughs> so, after the sixth box, yeah. a call from eBay. Hello, Mr. Brandred. Went, yes, rather a lot of ducks coming our way. I went, oh yes, sir. What's that all about then? He said, we believe they're fake. I said, I didn't say anything about them, sir. He said, I'm afraid we're going to have to sort of withdraw and ban you. I said, how long for? He said, for life. I went, oh really? <laughs> so what are you saying about for a duck then? He said, <laughs> so, no, I can't, I'm banned from eBay. <laughs> to this day. Life yeah. ban, yeah. I did ask him, I said, what about good behaviour? Life to get in, Nick. <laughs> To eBay. <laughs> Little drink there. So you were, you were doing it for 20 years, did you say? The, oh, 30 years. 30 making. years. Longer, I think. There, there must be hundreds of my pictures everywhere, Looking really. You know, yeah. you know. what, what, what would you say was the um, highlight then of that 30 years? Um, not uh, um, peace of mind, rest. And, and doing my own thing. You know, being free. You know, and uh, love me. I love meeting people. I love this. This is so me naturally. You know, there's nothing. I'm not even aware of. Well, he's a lovely fellow over there, but I'm not. <laughs> he's a lovely, but I'm lovely not aware thoughts. of it. <laughs> My old ghost rider up there, bless him. I didn't know he was here actually. <laughs> but you know, that's been good. That's what I love people now. Relaxing. I still paint, but but the the harder the subject, the more I like it. Mm. If it, I mean, I love Coolidge. I don't know about the old masters. I mean, I'm not, I'm not, none of my fellow artists talk to me much now, really, because I've risen from the ashes, haven't I, buddy? I really have. They don't talk to me now. So where does the law draw the line then? Are you allowed to reproduce yeah. a famous painting, but if you sell it as an original, is that when the fraud is committed? Yeah. So oh. you can paint these things all day long without breaking the law. On the back of that, you will see, <coughs> you'll see <coughs> Max Brandrick after Banksy. Right, and then I always do a, a little monogram of my sort of features. So, but a few weeks, months, a year, a year, no, last last year, a gallery rang me out and said somebody's faking your Banksy's, and he came in with it and he went, oh, "I've got a Max Brander here." <laughs> he said, "He said, turn it around." He went, "That's not Max." He said, "Where's his Max monogram? He should have a caricature at the back." He went, "Probably forgot to do it." So oh. they're in faking me. I was even faking Tom Keating. <laughs> well, that's quite an accomplishment, isn't it, when people are faking you? Yeah. Yeah, well. I, I fake. No, I'm on the last train to San Fernando of my age now. I've had a bloody good time. I'm not out yet, though. I'm not out, not yet. So I'm going to keep painting. I won't be chained to my easel. This is what I love people. Talking to people. Yeah. This is probably the nicest interview I've had. This is why Thank we, so much. I certainly feel I've got the, the easiest and the most privileged job in the world, just going out and meeting interesting people such yeah. as yourself. And you've got some nice, you've, you know, but isn't it nice to get away from the, the sort of the, the regular thing? You know, you've had a lot of sort of faces on there, haven't you? Yes. You know. We are branching out. So we've had a couple of dominatrixes on recently. We've had a footballer. Yeah. And that's good. That's good. <laughs> a music yeah. artist. Music, yeah, yeah, musician from um, Jamaica. Jamaica. Yeah. yeah, and I, I was worried yeah. that you were going to go on the crime side of it today, but this is this is re this is how I this is real me. Yeah. You know, yeah. I wasn't. Um, Vice was near. Certainly, the other one. I was definitely not me. I was I like I've looked like you know like you're caught in the, in the headlights. Mm. Like I didn't like it, but no, there's there's things I remember. You know, mm. I mean. Uh, in Birmingham, I, I did a lot for the children up there. I, um, I went to a place, you know, in Birmingham when uh, the big heavies up there. Oh, I'll tell you one other thing. And I, I was on these love lines, you know, these dating sites. Oh, and, yes. And I complained. I kept getting all the large ones. It's not fair. I think you've got to share them out. <laughs> and I, I, the last one I met was at Brighton Station. She went, I won't eat much, love, because I'm on a diet. I went, okay. So we went over to the Central Pub. He comes over and he goes, um, 
He said, do you want to order? He said, she said, I'm not eating much today. She said, I'm on a bit of a diet. She said, uh, she said can I have double egg and chips, sausages, and uh, can you a slice of bread? And, I, and she said, oh, don't forget the beans as well. She said, double beans. So, so I was eating. I, I was always talking about myself. I didn't eat my sausage. She said, you're finishing that sausage, love? I went, wow. I said, I said be my <laughs> guest. Wow. I was going to ask about your love life. Have you ever been married? Or? Oh, yeah. I've got my daughter's a model. Your daughter's a model? Yeah, a model, yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, she's beautiful, isn't she? Stunning. Yeah. yeah. And how did you meet your first wife then? Well, I've had a couple. I've had a bunny girl, actually. I went out with a bunny girl. You went out with a bunny girl? A penthouse pet, actually. Where did you meet them? Oh, 1970s. Bunny, but you know, there was the pet, there was the, there was the, uh, there was the bunny club and there was the penthouse pets. They were sort of the same thing. Bob Cusiani, I think they were. And I went out with, um, well, I married her, actually, Linda. And she was a ship's captain um, daughter, you know, very high up. And, you know, me coming from a basement flat. I mean, you can imagine the time she's come from a big house and goes to a basement flat my mum was living in, in uh, Lansdowne Street. But we married. The only trouble is with me, I couldn't sustain uh, making money then. You know, I couldn't. I couldn't make... You know, it's ups and downs, you know. You, one day you're there... But, you know, and so we, we parted. But she, she got a job in the, as a penthouse pet. But she was, I, I did like her, I must admit. She was hard. I've had lots of, oh, I've got one on Tuesday, bless you. You know, she's all right. I said, I've got this. I said, listen, I've got this fantasy I want. And she said, what's that? I said, um, I want you to, you'll be in the bar first, right? I want you to dress up like a French tart. I want to come and pick you up. <laughs> I'll say to you, your place or mine. <laughs> You go and put all this in, will you? <laughs> oh, yeah, we keep everything. These are the best bits. <laughs> so you said, you know, at that point in your life, you were struggling to make ends meet. Yeah. How did it feel to finally be financially independent? Well, it's only recently. It's only uh, recently. Yeah, since I got banned from the ducks. <laughs> <laughs> what time eBay ban? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, I love it now. Yeah. I love this. I love. I loved meeting you two. Mm. Yeah. You know, I've loved it and all this, you know, I mean, it's yeah. good. It's, it's showing what it was like because I'm so pleased you're going to do that book because it's a, it's a romp through, not the, the, the forgery side is there, but there's all the things that built up to it. Yeah. I mean, I'm still, I, know, I, I say, to, to, um, I say to, to Tony that I still I think, oh, what about that? You know, I still think there were so many things happening, you know, and it, it doesn't end there. I mean, I'm a bit of a celeb now in this place, you know. Really? What, when the, you're walking around town? Oh, yeah, the Beau Brummel of Burgess Hill. I mean, they said, here, yeah, Max, you know, it's the film crew. Can they, you know, film me outside? No, not unless I get free haircut or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> not that bloody, not that. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, yeah, it's, this is what I love. This is the, what it was like, you know, from Bernardo's. I mean, at the end of the day, I'm not a villain. I mean, I haven't done the bad things. I mean, I, I, I tell you what, I was... Um, I was, I was in um, Ford Open, I got, I got stretched in there, in there, and I heard that Lester Pickett was in there. And oh, it was tax something, was he yeah, tax fraud, tax evasion? Yeah, and he'd been in there, and he, he gets privileges. He didn't get, we were in his army nissance up, you know, Sean, he was in the governor's wing, you know. Mm. Uh, but, uh, did oh. he, did he, was this before or after he'd forged his signature? Uh, Oh, oh no, I, I know it was after. After? Yeah, yeah. So did he have a word of you about that? <laughs> no, he certainly didn't like me. <laughs> oh, his wife. I mean, oh, well, they took me to court, didn't they? Yeah. I got fined seven grand. Did seven you? grand? Yeah, wow. I didn't pay it. I just did a runner. Still up. Still <laughs> up. <laughs> He's still out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, and he, I remember my sister saying, Mr. Brandred is not a rich man, yet he's, he's not a poor man. I went, yes, I am. And you know, I remember a judge saying to me one day when I was up for forgery, he said, Mr. Brandon, you're a very accomplished painter. Why do you persist in doing these forgeries? He said, well, sir, it's like this. When I see an old canvas, I get withdrawal symptoms. I need to paint on it. <laughs> <laughs> it is. You get an urge to paint. That's an interesting observation, though, by him. I mean, you're so skilled... You could have just done your own originals and had your own brand. I don't think you could. I don't, no? I don't think you could. Unless you're someone like um, um, Hockney or someone like that. And he, he got it. He was quite lucky. It's, I tried everything to meet the right people. Really? You know? When I did these variety clubs, I did it 
um, but with the children in mind, but also um, to meet the right people. And I did, I met on top table, I met, I mean, I was on the table with Vera Lynn. But unfortunately, I was pissed. I said, give us a song, Vera. <laughs> she didn't like that. <laughs> she didn't like that. That was in Brighton, that's when I met Chris. Jimmy Hill, I met him. Uh, the guy from Faulty Towers, I met all those people. Um, yeah. John Cleese. John no, Cleese. not John Cleese, the chef in it, Robin. Oh, oh you know, well, all, all well, the, well. Yeah, all these, so, and Dollar, I didn't like him. And Jess Conrad, I couldn't stand him. <laughs> I said, I was did a charity in Bournemouth. And I said, well, who, who are you then? Because I was, I was giving him a, a painting to, to the children. And he went, I was a pop singer. And I said, did you have any hits? He went, he went, ah, oh. I said, did you have one like, because, uh, uh, and he said, yes, it was very, it was not, sold a million. I said, no, it didn't. It was, it, does it go like, sitting on the thing, didn't me to dream one day. And he just didn't like me. So, <laughs> you know, always having a go at me. Mm. So you don't paint your own stuff whatsoever? No. No? Never been tempted? Uh, no, not really. And um, what is my stuff? Well, what is it? I'm a, yeah. I'm a, ex-forger i hate it when you say when they say forger uh, i was but all these people today i mean a certain artist will have said i've been fooling the experts for years how can you fool experts years on new canvas uh, i mean i did things in nick i mean because that would pen and ink drawings but you couldn't the, the governor if you were doing a sort of a I don't know, I don't know, Carab well, you, you know, we didn't do Caravaggio's, you couldn't walk around. They were lesser painters, but, you know, m making good money. I hit the for four, oh, you don't put that in it. I, I hit one gallery in Bond Street for 60 grand, yeah. How corrupt is the art world? Uh, I, I, I think it is, I think it is now. There is, there's four of us who are known as to be good forgers. One German guy, he's very good. I can't pronounce his name, but, and uh, there's other little ones, but, but no, he was good. But Van Meegen was one, in the war, he was good. I, I reckon if somebody said where you are, I'd say about three or four down. Because I, the thing is, what one, day, one guy said to me, well, he said, you know, you are so good at the colours, Max. How do you, it's just now. If they said to me, like your colour of, um, you know the story of this, don't you? No. Th th this is St. That's that's Caravaggio. No, that's um, that's Caravaggio himself there. Here. Oh, is it? There's the two soldiers. Mm. Yeah. Also, I think if you've got any questions as well, James, because yeah, he's I'll a very knowledgeable man, our James, Caravaggio yeah. James. Why don't you just put it at the side, James? Or I show. You want to buy it then? <laughs> so what's the story of this one? What's that? The story right. of this one? The, it goes like, there's Caravaggio there. Yeah. They're with the holding the lantern up. They're the two soldiers. That's Judas. There's Jesus and that's St. Peter. That's the oh. taking of Christ. Gotcha. It, it's not a bad copy, that, if it's I might say so. How off, switch how switch off? one of those bars off. How often did he put himself in his own painting? Every painting. Every painting? He was a villain. He was, now there you was could he? have done a great story of him. He murdered somebody. Good grief. Yeah, he, he died at the age of 43, yeah. Natural or unnatural death? I don't know, I think he was murdered. Himself. Was he duelling someone? Yeah. yeah. But, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. So would you say then that you know, you've got all these old classics obviously that, that keep going up in value and then you have these new artists but the value of a, it doesn't seem like much cop in comparison to some of these old classics. And would you say the value of some of these paintings is just psychology? It is. Mm. And, and also, uh, I will say it, Sean, in the game, it's who you know mm. to sell your pictures. I mean, um, what's it? And uh, Emma, when we made the bed, what's, what's her name? Tracy Emin. Tracy, Tracy Emin. Emin. I mean, a million pounds for an unmade bed, come on. And what she's doing now, I mean, it's just who you know in the game. Yeah. Uh, it's it's and Damien Hurst, you know. And th mm. I think they get so carried away with the money. There's mm. only so much money you need. I don't want all... I mean, it's not going to happen to me anyway. You know, this is more important to me, sitting with mm. two and talking, you know. So they, Sorry, so they make the money and then it becomes a production line, does it? I think they become... They get too much, so mm. they, there's no incentive. I, I mean, I'm obviously going to go back to doing forgeries, but... I still love the buzz of people, and the, yeah. I've always been like that. I, I seem to, 
and I meet people, I sort of mimic them mm. of who they were, you know. Like, I always remember, like, hello, darling. I'll tell you what, I did an exhibition in Tunbridge Wells about 12, 14 years ago, and Tim, the, the place called the Pentiles, very, very exclusive. And it was with Timothy Nebel who owned the Cook, Cook's Gallery. And he had an exhibition of all fakes and things like that, legit ones. And he went, Max, he said, do you think you could put your voice on a little bit more aristocratic? You know, some of the people come in are very influential. Went, of course, James, there's no problem there, Timothy. So the first lot come in, there's lots of wine there. And then she goes, how I love your, the way you get those colours, Max, it's amazing. I went, I know, it's uncanny, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so listen, so I, I have another glass of wine and by the end of about oh, two bottles going, Hello, darling, what are you looking at? That's a bit of a gun. I do, as they do know, is that when I've had a little drink, I talk a lot. Mm. Well, probably think I've had a drink today. When I think. <laughs> yeah, that's a, yeah. So what do you think of places like the Tate Modern? Have you been there? Yeah. Yeah? yeah. I do, I, yeah. I do prefer the National Portrait Gallery, though. Oh, yeah. I do. I, I love, I love skilled art you know love the old masters you know the colors i mean you know I'd, I'd, you know with larry i mean I, I don't i cannot understand why he makes that sort of money you do one little skinny figure walking the dog like you know and you're on sort of like 50 grand for it. it's crazy you know i've got one artist friend who does nothing but mm. you know but he does he does a good job on them you know but it's not for me medigliani larry yeah, Picasso, Picasso. Where is that? What's that all about? <laughs> LSD. <laughs> Mushrooms. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, I like Larry. I like, and he never married. He painted in his bedroom between two single beds, you know. And, and uh, where did it come from? You know, it's weird. But why is he worth two, three million pounds? You know, I've copied his work. It's not difficult, is it? No. What you about know? the Mona Lisa? Uh, uh, yeah, I, yeah, I think that's... That's great work, but sometimes you think, yeah, well, where, where? I, but people ask me to do the go with a pearl earring. Mm. I don't want to do that. Everybody's done it, you know. Mm. My friend's favourite is uh, the Edward Munch scream. Oh, the, oh yeah. yeah. Can you do that? See, one? see what I mean? You know? Yeah. Mm. <laughs> I want to do that seriously. It's not for me. I, could be, I mean, I, I get people. I mean, look at the guy said to me. Uh, he bought he bought one called Follow That Dream, a Banksy. Then he asked me the other day. Can you do a Lowry at the size 40 30? I mean, that means that's that one portrait wise. Mm. A Lowry that big, you, the guy doesn't, Lowry doesn't even join the bloody figures up, you know. <laughs> and you want, you want figures that big that haven't got a head on it? Come on, man. I went, no, no, thank you. I'd rather so I decline that offer. And do you like my favourite Klimt? Yeah, I do. His dad was a goldsmith, wasn't he? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Fascinating. Oh, I've done. Um, I've done Van Gogh, The Prison Yard. I'd like that. I've done, uh, oh God, what was that one I did? I, I did Picasso with all colours of, oh, I did it upside down. I didn't even know. <laughs> <laughs> so he still accepted. I, well, I said he didn't know which bloody ended up. It was, it was Man with the Guitar. I, for the love of me, Jen, I never worked out which side it was. <laughs> and uh, that went over to Spain. And uh, yeah, I've done... Um, I, oh, I've done that. I don't like the modern stuff. Mm. How many requests do you get a month? Huh? How many requests do you get a month to do oh, a painting? Uh, quite a lot. I mean, I, I do. I Do you want to do this? Commissions I get, yeah. Mm. Um, I, do you know what? The other day, I was in, like, a couple of weeks, I was in Brighton. I saw my older, saw the old fraud squad that used to sort of bug me. Like, uh, a few years ago, I was banked the rights in the lanes. Let's go back 25 years ago. And I had it. Couple of, I had a couple of bloody uh, Samuel Palmer's in there. If I didn't nick me, they knew they got me. So I'm walking around, I saw Mugglesham and Lichman there, and I thought, hello. I'm walking around the lanes, I thought, I know what I'll do. So I walked them and followed them up to a guy who owned a sex shop, right? So I walked in there and I went, I, went, I said, Jamie, I said, look, I said, those two are a couple of um, they're perverts out there. They come and start looking at the knickers, actually. So can I use your back door? So, so, and he came in and I rang him back. I said, I went out, I said, gentlemen, I'm sorry, but this is, this is not the place for you. He said, <laughs> he said, he said we're, sorry, we're CID. He, went, mm, he said, sorry, you still have to leave. He said, <laughs> Did that gentleman, he said, which, oh no, I said, he's gone. So they wow. were always after me. Always after you? Yeah. Good grief. And your contemporaries then, 
do you have like competitors in what you would used to do yeah. and did you correspond with them or did they well, not did, did they, they dis dislike you oh they like me but they i became <laughs> now i'm not saying it, I, I, i'm good yeah i'm good and that you're putting them out of business, were you? Yeah, yeah, in a way, because I've got all this publicity. Mm. And when they see me on the TV thing and they see the work, it all gels. But, you know, I'm not going to say anything against them, but I've gone to, I, I, I love them. I, I love them to do what they do, but you don't have to not talk to me. I didn't do anything to them, you know. So yeah. I just, I live here. I live my life very humbly, you know. Mm -hmm. I get my Viagra downstairs. <laughs> yeah. Pharmacy, yeah. Yeah, no, I just send a basket down. <laughs> what do you want, mate? Dumb waiter, is that called? <laughs> oh, you're not going to put all this in, are you? <laughs> of course, these are the best bits. <laughs> That's a wonderful hat you got there. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Talk yeah. through that. And I, I love this art, you know, that telephone is lovely, that black Isn't one. Can I bring it down? Yeah. Look at that one as well. I've yeah. got look at the blue tonight, one as well. I've been what, looking at that one the whole yeah. time. Okay. I've got, yeah. Oh. Wow. Does it work? Yeah. It's not plugged in, but it does work. What year is that then? Yeah. Eh? Well, I tell everybody that was a Hitler's, in Hitler's bunker. <laughs> <laughs> wonderful, it looks it? like it, it predates the Twilight Zone. I think it's Belgium, okay. actually, or German, Belgium. but it's it lovely. does work. Yeah. Well, Pictures have one of them. I've never seen one of those. I'm going on eBay tonight back. and you're looking at retro phones. Sean has just ordered some Chesterfields <laughs> like this bit in blue because I've got a blue one. Have you? That one. I yeah. like them. They're not, yeah. they're not comfortable, but I love them. Oh, I find mine comfy. Yeah, do you? Yeah. Yeah. It's all God. Apologies. Do you live in Guildford then? I do, yes. Yeah. It's, it's beautiful. And um, there's a lot of countryside there, and there's like deer and foxes and badgers and everything. It's yeah. Well, can I say one thing before I forget? Yeah. I've had lots of people want me to do book signings with this book. Okay. I've got a following on, on the appreciation societies. Did you know that? No. I've got about a thousand on that one. Great. And all these people are waiting. When's the book coming out? When's the book? Yeah. When's the book fans. signing? We will have a book signing, won't we? Yeah, of course. But we'll, I'm not. We'll... I'm not going to do signature. No, I'm not going to do to mum and all, or to whatever. Mm. I'm going to do a caricature on the back because I, um, I, I don't think it's like. Um, what's your name? Or you know, I, I just do and sign it as well. Mm. I've got little, few little horse prints for you when you go. Fantastic. Oh, thank you. Uh, yeah, Party yeah, good. Yeah. Do you get out in Brighton very much? Oh, yeah. I sit, I sit in George Street, and because I'm a little bit of a celeb there, hello, <laughs> Maxi, and I watch the world go by to you, oh. you know. I watch the Black Widow and their little games they play, like, yeah. hello, Max, you having a glass of wine today? And you think, suddenly you're, you're buying a bottle. <laughs> and they go around, they go around, um, you know, and just sit there and, and uh, just think that that's their game. And then one of them actually, one called G uh, Gordon, he brings his own bloody glass over and he goes, I wouldn't mind a little top up in there. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know I've never been to Brighton? Hmm? I've never been to Brighton. Oh, you've never been to Gay Pride? No, I've been to Gay Pride, not the Brighton one. Oh. But I've never been to Brighton. Okay. No. It's like, it's really, it's really, like, really it's nice. a bit like, so, it's like Soho on the sea, isn't it? Oh, you go to the lanes, you know. The lanes? Oh, it's lovely. I'm telling Jen about the lanes on the it's way down. Oh, there. you've got to go there. Yeah. Yeah. Go to Donatello's and, um, and the basket makers and, and Druids. I mean, you know, mm. oh, it's lovely. I mean, the, a lot of the, the antique dealers, there's no, uh, you, you see on a Friday, uh, afternoon, you see all the dealers coming back from on the knock, you know, all the knocker boys bringing and selling their stuff. No, that's all gone now. You know, I used to do quite a lot of paintings for Jack Powell, you know, fakes and that, and the, because the aging is so important, you know, the 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 uh, the cracking. We don't always crack every one of them, but just faking it. What up. does that mean, the cracking? Well, it's like a you know the crackula on an old picture; it starts to crack, you know. Ah, so you got to replicate that. Yeah, well, I did. I, I got it with bee glue. I mean, I've got it on my with, with glue. Bee, bee, it's called a bee glue. Bee glue. And uh, it's like I'll give you the process. Um, it's uh, you buy it from a hardware <coughs> store, and you probably pay about a pound for about six pound of it. But it looks like lentils. You put that in a dish, in a pan, cold water, overnight, it goes to a jelly. Next morning, you put it on the stove and it goes to like a liquid, like a varnish, you know. And you varnish that over your picture, then you take it that very famous old fire and you circulate the painting and it starts to crack it. 
You can actually hear it cracking. Wow. Now, don't forget, then after you've got enough cracks, you go to the tap, you wash the bee glue off because it's water-based, empty your hoover on it, fill it on, all the cracks are filled with dirt, and then into the old canvas, in back with the nails where they used to be, been in the garden for six months, under glass, in the frame, bang. I've got to ask, where did you learn all this? Uh, I think you just, I got it from a, a guy that was a restorer. And then Tom Keating showed me that, you know, how to fake, you know. He was good at faking. Wasn't very good at much else, though. <laughs> when you're passing these off, then, how important is the framing? Yeah, good. Mm. Yeah. And, and also, Sean, when you look at a canvas, you can tell if it's, uh, if it's right, it has to be, uh, most canvases are wedged. You know, they were, but in the old days, they didn't have the mitering. So you could say that's not an old one, but we had to find the right canvas for the right age, you know. And so if you did a marine on it, it had to suit that period of about the 1830s if you're doing an Albert Derby, you know. So everything was, you know, we, we, we knew what we were doing. We, we not once, I think, did we ever get fronted up by any, any you know, but then you found out it was about because they went there with Nick, you know. Listen. So did you have to become an expert in framing then? No, no, that's a lovely frame. That's Isn't it gorgeous? gorgeous? Yeah. Yeah. Where did you source that one? Oh no, that's an old one. That's a modern one. Is that it? cost 250 quid that. Yeah. On eBay? Yeah, well before. <laughs> you still I, I didn't buy it. I'm not allowed on eBay. <laughs> so you're not allowed to buy on it either? Huh? You're not allowed to no, buy on it? No, nothing. I'm wow. totally banned. I'm, even in auction rooms I'm not allowed in now. The bell goes when I walk in. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? This is just me, this. Oh. This Brilliant. is just me. I worried today, I thought you might think I was boring. No, not at all, we're fascinated. And I love your interviews, you're very natural. Oh, thank you. Yeah. We try our good, best, don't we? Mm -hmm. yeah, it's good. Yeah. Jen has brought a lot of um, beautiful energy to the room, haven't you? The last guest proposed to her halfway through the, the interview. <laughs> he just stopped the interview and said, Jen, you're so beautiful. Oh, he's very yeah. kind. Very kind <laughs> Yeah, you're a bit of a looker. Oh, thank you. It made my day come in, I thought, oh, God. <laughs> yeah. Well, I do my love pleasure. your interviews. I like how relaxed you are, you know. Is there any of those interviews um, in particular that have interested you? Any, any ones that you uh, No, I don't know who they are. Yeah. But I like yeah. your style, that's what I'm saying. Just having a conversation. Yeah, but, but you don't. The, the others, yeah. I mean, the, when I did. Um, uh, how um, how crime works. Mm. He he was on a list, and that doesn't work. And if you feel uncomfortable, I was not like this at all. Mm. I I just I felt uncomfortable. I'd come all the way from Victoria Station, mm. twenty nine degrees, and I thought I didn't like the setup there. Yeah. You know, he went. And when did you do this? And I thought, no, that's not me. Mm. I want to be sort of. Natural. Can I have another little drink? It's all right. I've done it. I'm nearly finished it. Well, I haven't finished. In, in, interviewing people. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, Do you want a, a glass of sherry? I, I'm good, thank you. <laughs> Cheers. Sure, you I'll, would. I'll have a little one then, yeah. Okay. Just to join oh. you. I haven't had sherry yes. in years. What it is, Max, you're a natural raconteur. Yeah. So we've breezed in here today. We've watched your interviews and we know that we could just ask you a few little things and you'll, you, you'll go with your own story <laughs> in, in, in a great yeah. way. I go over the road there and I gave him two horse prints and of his um, Pakistani, lovely guy, lovely family. Every time, that was two years ago, every time I go in, they go, hello, sir, what do you want? I went, no, no just some tea bags. He went, you have tea bags? Do you want a bottle of sherry? He went, he's giving me a bottle oh. of sherry. He's so not, do you want, to, he gave me a bloody food parcel. I said, I'm not on benefits. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that a lot of people have got brilliant stories, but they don't know how to tell them. Yeah. So sometimes you see us, we've got notes. We don't have a load of set questions, but we've got notes because we've researched their story yeah. and we know how to like ask them questions to get them to tell those stories. Yeah. They need they need that extra oomph. Yeah, well, but, but with you, you just you just do, take it do away, you don't some, you? I started doing when I to get money. It was called Entertainment Direct, and it was to go down to a theatre like the Corn Exchange in Brighton and do a, 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 t a little talk to the senior citizens in the 80s and they used to come all over. Go and looking like David Dickinson, go on stage, microphone, painting and that I used to paint and it used to go onto a big screen. And I walked in the first night, I said, nurse, 
She said, I said, they're all a bloody asleep and the first six rows are asleep. She went, oh, they'll be all right, they'll be all right. So anyway, I'm on there looking like David Dixon and very cocking around like this. And they go, and yes, and you do this. And I show them the skill of using Brolec undercoat and a hairdryer to make it dry. I said, Donnie, could you bring a few of them to the side of the stage? She goes, and I said, and I leaned down with the microphone, what's your name, Donnie? She goes, I'm Martha and this is my friend Cynthia. I said, is that your painting there? She went, yes. I said, can I have a look? So I bring the painting out. I said, oil, you're using oil. She went, yes. I said, you know, when you're doing the sky, how long does it take to dry? She went, well, it's about 14 weeks. I said, darling, how old are you? She said, I'm 98. I said, darling, you've got to speed it up a bit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so, mm -hmm. She said, what do you mean, Max? I said, we use Brolac undercoat and a hairdryer. And I do it, and it goes all around the audience. I go, it's a miracle. So I can't do anything. <laughs> I love teaching them. I love yeah. it. You stand and listen to their stories, you know. Oh, God. Anyway. Do people come to you a lot uh, asking you if you, like, mentor them and stuff? Yeah. And mm. you have to be selective about that because of your time? And yeah. yeah. This is me, though, talking mm. to people, you know, not showing off so much, but letting people know what it was like, yeah. you know, in their four, the 50s, and it was a good time. The 60s, you'd have loved it. Oh, oh my yeah. God. You know, you're only youngsters, but my God. You know, you go back to 68, Portobello Road. Not that stuff in Carnaby Street, all those jackets they used to wear, like military stuff, you know. Did you wear you know. flares? Oh, I did, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Platforms. Yeah, and their hot pants and the mini skirts. Oh, yeah. they. you meant on you. Huh? <laughs> you meant on you. No, no. No, but they were good. I mean, yeah. they were lovely. It was such a colourful... I mean, today I'm, a, I'm sort of... We've all gone Lowry looking. We all look like Lowry's. <laughs> I mean, I, I say in my... I had an advert in the newspaper, like, um, at my dating was like, Max Brandry, artist, walking contradiction, partly truth, partly fiction, wishes to meet young lady, candlelight dinners <laughs> and a free potted plant. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't have any, any potted plants. What? Oh, loads. Yeah. <laughs> loads. <laughs> I said, I mean, I was bringing back a potted plant on this date and I got to the station. They all know I have a drink and they put me and the doors closed on my bloody plants. So I left half of it on the platform. So, <laughs> so I applied next door. I said, did you see a plant on your platform? There? He said, what is it? I said, the top half of my plant. I've only got the stem. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> So what would you say are the highest and lowest points of your life? Uh, I think losing my mum, bless her. Oh. 91. Uh, no, she wasn't 91. She died in 91. Yeah, that was because mm. I, uh, I was banged up then, you know, I didn't like it. You did know, she I visit you before that? No, I, I kept disappearing, Sean. My, mm. my, I think the hardest thing is like mum would say to my brother, have you found Max yet? Because I was, didn't know I was in Nick, you know. I think that was tough. Yeah. But when I came back, I'm... Um, you know, you know, it was it was tough because she was such a fabulous lady. Did they know? let you out for the funeral back then? No, no, no. they did the crazy, didn't they? Yeah. Not me, though. No. Yeah. No. No. And you were very close with your mum. Oh, you? absolutely. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> she was. Um, uh, she was like strong, you mm. know. And what they do in those days, they used to sort of come down and work in service, you know. Um, for my mum had five jobs. You know, you, and then five, ch four children, you know, and then, because mum, mum didn't want that. But, you know, but, uh, there's a picture of my mother I drew, look. Oh, wow. that's ninety. Yeah, I did a little picture. Doesn't she? Mm. Yeah. She, that was, my mum had, uh, oh, I'll tell you how I met, my mum met my dad. Yeah. Oh, I didn't tell you about my dad, did you? Oh, no, oh what a rogue he was. Uh, no, and um, my, uh, my brother's, I'm a, I'm a brand rep, they're Harris, right? So my mum, uh, she was already married to Kenneth Harris, Bernard Harris, and my, he was in the war, fighting in wherever, well, I don't know who he was, fighting. But um, mum went out with a lady called Margaret. They were going to the Hibbers room to see Max Miller. Right, so she said, she'll have her photograph taken, love. So they did that in Western Road, and they went down to saw Max Miller, loved it. And coming back to the station, my mum was only 18 years old, she said, should we have a drink in the Compton? So she goes in the Compton pub, sitting with Margaret with their little sherry. Who walks in? She said, the door opens. This very tall gentleman comes in with beautiful swept hair back. And he was so suited and booted. He had a carnation on. And he turned around to us. And he went, good evening, ladies. Can I buy you a drink? And my mum went, oh, she said, I melted. That was my dad. 
That was my dad. She said, wow. said can I join you? And, uh, and this, Mark, this other friend was saying, watch him. He's a bit of a playboy, I can see that. So my mum said I was all in all of him. And my mum, not only that, she married him, and yet she was still married to Bernard Harris. I've got her, I've got her marriage certificate. She went as Dorothy King. <laughs> what about that? She told me all about him. He was, um, he was a, uh, a con man. He walked the race courses, right? He used to go, which you can look it up, he used to be with a guy called Prince Honolulu. He used to go with Brighton race course and say, I got a bet, I got a bet. My father worked the race courses, giving these phony tips. But he also painted horse racing pictures, as you will see. So I do the same thing. Oh. And then he, he left. So can you imagine what it was like when Bernice Harris came back after the war? And he goes, who the hell's that then? <laughs> oh, his name's Max. So, but it, the thing is that when we went into the homes, I couldn't be Max Brandrit. I had to be Harry Harris. <laughs> Do you know why? Because my brothers were Tony Harris and Joe and Kenny Harris. Mum thought it'd be a bit odd if I went in as Brandrit. So, and I and so I used to say, they used to go, I used to go, Harry, Harry Harris. And I thought I didn't take any. You rude boy! I didn't. Who the hell was he? <laughs> What have your siblings made of all this then? Mm. Oh, well, they've always think I'm a little bit. They're quite. They're quite. You're mm, the black sheep. They're very sort of laid back. No, they're. They're just. They're not. They just live that life, but they haven't done anything. I've always been this one that's gone through. <laughs> you know. Yeah. My brother. I like my brother Tony. My brother. He's, he's mm. nice, but he's a bit shy. You know. You wouldn't get him sitting here. He wouldn't even come in the room. Mm. <coughs> no. <coughs> no. Do you see them often? Oh, yeah. Yeah. No, um, he came up with my daughter the other day. I mean, um, his wife was annoyed at me because I gave him two spritzes. <laughs> he got a little bit merry. <laughs> you know, I told him, I said, I said, Tony, listen, when you come in again, they might come up and say to you, listen, you've got to watch your drinking, Tony, because you're getting embarrassing. <laughs> He's lovely anyway, all the time. Kenny's, uh, Kenny's very small. That's Bernard Harris's uh, boy, but I'm... Max, uh, my, my Joseph Maximilian Brandit is my father. Bernard Harris is, is my other brothers, and my sister. She's passed away, bless her. Now mm. she died of um, dementia. So. Oh. Sorry to hear. That's sherry good, isn't it? It's nice, isn't it? It's sweet. Shame mm. you can't try a bit. <laughs> anyway, well, look, this is uh, this is lovely. I love Cheers. it. This it's like a Saturday afternoon chat, isn't it? Mm. I'm not even know you're there. What's, yeah. what's the best stories that we may have missed today, Tony, that we could ask no. Max about? Well, um, there's so many. I mean, Max didn't mention that uh, he was once great friends with Pat Edry. Right. Mm. Oh, yeah. yeah. Can you explain to the viewers who Pat is? Pat Edry's a jockey. Yeah. One of the best jockeys. One of the best the jockeys. Ever. Yeah. yeah. Oh. How did that um, come about? That. Yeah, I am. Um, as you see, you when I go, you've got some limited prints. So I'm going to let you have. Right? Thank you. I did one of what's called warning. So I telephoned up his agent, found it, and he was living in um, Newark, Newbury, and and uh, Terry Ellis. And I said I want Pat to endorse my print. And I and I rang, and he arranged a meeting at Ascot in the Champagne Room. And I really liked Pat, and he liked my story. And he said to me. Well, OK, I'll sign some of your prints, but just give me the original and I'll do all your prints, which is worth about two grand. He said, also, don't you play tennis? I went, yeah, I do play tennis, actually. So, so I went to, his to, to sign some prints one day and he got a big bloody tennis court on there. And he so I said, do you want a game of singles? He went, yeah. Uh, and he said, I said, you know, you're easy to beat. I said, because I can just lob you. <laughs> you're so <laughs> short. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he was a lovely guy, and I did a horse called Warning, and that's and I knew all the, I, I, do you know I, well, no, I, I can't really say who I don't like, can I? I really didn't get on with um, Le, um, Willie Carson. Mm -hmm. I didn't get on with him very well. But Pat Edry was lovely. He was um, top jockey. Um, he, he drank a little bit, I and mean, he's gone now, bless him. But yeah, he used to stay there. What other stories? Why have I missed anything? Yeah, I think I've covered my old life story. Isn't it? Got any questions, James? Uh, yeah. Well, I was just going to say, like, if um, people um, ask you for commissions and like, say, how would they, how do they normally go about doing that? If you... That's my pacemaker. Hmm. Tells me my heart's beating away with excitement. Yeah. 
<laughs> Phew. <laughs> Guilty. Lay, uh, off no. that, lay off that Viagra. <laughs> yeah, do you need any to have that? I've got boxes in there. Oh, God. <laughs> oh, there's a guy that I've got to say this. I'm going to say it. He knocks on the door. His name's, uh, well, I'll give his name as A. And he knocks on the door, and uh, he's, you know, he's a lovely guy. And the other night, he knocked on what about half past 12 at night. He went, Max. He went, What? Well, got any tablets? He went, It's bloody half past 12. And he's got a big Zulu behind him go, You buy. <laughs> you buy tablets. So I thought, I'm going to top him up. So he just annoys me. He went, How much? I said, I've only got two tablets left, and if I don't deliver this tablet, I'll get a good hiding from this big, uh, heavy, I know. He went, I said, 60 quid. He went, what? 30 quid a tablet? I went, you want it? And this, this, he kept poking him in, you buy. <laughs> <laughs> Busy night. I did try it in America, but um, it wouldn't go down for a couple of days. And to have a what? wee, to have a wee, I had to lean against the wall and push oh, it down. Yeah. So it was <laughs> well, you know, I'll tell you what. <laughs> I, I did. A, I met a, in a, one of these charity dues. I met a lady called Margaret, and she was a magistrate. I thought handy because I got nicked again. She's on the bench. I'll walk. There you go. So, and she was attracted to me, you know. And she said to me, uh, having a drink, said, "I love a portrait done." I went, "Okay." And she had a big house on the London Road in Brighton. So I arrived there, and I got my little camera. And she said, I sat there. I said, "So do you want portrait up there?" I went. She said, I want a nude. I went. Oh, okay. So she gets in there like a, on the duvet. I was going to ask if you've been asked to paint like Titanic style Kate Winslet. No, it was a, yeah, no, <laughs> it was, yeah, no, it was a reclining nude. So I did it and I did a bloody good job of it. It was a, she still got it on her wall. It was a, 20, a 2430. And I remember I delivered it to a pub and, uh, and I showed it. She went, oh, I love that, I love it. And, um, but the payment was two grand. But I had to perform on the night, if you know what I mean. <laughs> but this is, I know I'm going to say it. So as we're performing, and she's on top of me, and on the mantelpiece is the envelope with two grand in it, and I couldn't keep my bloody eyes off it. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going up and down as you do, and I can't, <laughs> seriously. And I finished. She went, she went, oh, God. I said, oh, dear, because Mark Viagra gives you heart, you know, power there. And I went, oh, God. I said, oh, well, oh, I said, oh, that was good for you. She went, oh, it's lovely, darling. And I went, oh, that pink envelope with that bloody money in it. I went, well, I better head off home. It's she said it's three in the morning. I went, oh, is it? I said, I've got to feed the cat. She said, you haven't got a cat. I went, oh, next door neighbour's cat then. <laughs> <laughs> that was Margaret. <laughs> Still see her, but not in that respect. <laughs> she got, yeah, yeah so. Brilliant. Mm. Any others then, Tony? What was James' question? Oh, yes. I'm yeah, so oh, sorry. I'm sorry, James. So someone's watching this video and they'd yeah. like to commission you to oh, yeah. paint something. What, how would both uh, go about doing that? Oh, well, they go on um, my, what is it, email address? Yeah, we can to die, yeah. We can, I've got this. We can uh, include all those links. Yeah, I've got yeah, yeah I've got Marion who's done so much, you know, with my um you know, stories. I mean, we people follow me now and they they keep asking for the book. And I'm so good that I'm so when I we were gonna we were we were looking at Troubadour, you know, and I don't think that's a good but I once I've got the book, I'll tell you one thing, I'm a walking I don't need PR. And my own machine anyway. I just go for it, you know. I've got to, there's a place called the, the Bally, which is a restaurant, and they want me in there. But you know, I'll leave it all up to you. But mm. I really, how, how is it? How, what, what's, what happens on the next step then? So we're waiting for the cover photo. Yeah. Um, is it an acknowledgement or a credit yeah, or something? Yeah, I've got those. And then we can send it to the editor. Yeah, yeah. okay. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, when will yeah. it roughly be released? Um, it was very well written, so it doesn't need much editing. So once we've got this photo, mm -hmm. and once we've got the uh, credits mm -hmm. that you're going to do, the afterword or whatever it is, it, it should be out quite quickly. The e-book mm. and the paperback should be out quite quickly. Yeah. And then the audio book can take anywhere from three to six months, depending upon how long it yeah. goes into the Amazon Audible review for. So yeah, it should be, should be I mean, James is going to take the photo today. Have you yeah. finished writing the, the, the credits or whatever it was? The uh, well, he has, but 
Yeah, yeah, my my driver. Oh. <laughs> no, my driver went Once on. Once you a, get all this in, it's done. Yeah. It's done. Yeah, okay. Yeah. We'll, we'll, yeah. We'll, have, we'll have those for you. To, um, I'll Next have those because he went on the binge last night. Okay. And, I, and he went <laughs> off him, bloody driver. So we're almost at the finishing line. Yeah. Did you know I was on holiday in Wales and and I um, was near the Telford Bridge, right? And these barges, you know. Mm. And this guy was doing these lovely sort of designs, and I thought, and I ran up to him. And, I used to do that. And he went, he looked at me and said, are you Max Brander? I went, yeah. <laughs> I, thought, I, couldn't, I said, I said, I just looked at your documentary last night. He said, you're a legend. I went, no. Yeah, yeah, perhaps I am actually. <laughs> <laughs> Humble. How did the Vice documentary come about? The what? The Vice. Oh, that was through um, Chris Ellis from The Bill. Mm. And they just, I know, I've known, I've known Louis and uh, his dad said, well, got in fact, Tony, Tony's done a lot of scripts from, for the bill, and mm. then, then it all got from there, and I met Tony. We'd been working on this on the phone, because I've got an imagine, I've got a very good memory. Mm. At my age, I really have. I can remember details, you know, like you wouldn't, the names, mm. and because I never forget who I meet, you know? Yeah, yeah. I mean, even in Nick, I knew, I knew all the screws' names, you know? I mean, I've met guys that said, yeah, I've done a bit of bird. Mm. Then you find out they haven't. Mm. You can always test them. One, not so long ago, and you said, Oh, yeah, I've done bird. I went, oh, yeah, what'd you do? He said, I've done Dorchester. I went, OK. I said, did you split your matches? He went, oh, yeah, I used to share them. I said, no, I'm talking about splitting them. He went, he went what's that mean? I said, you used to razor them. Well, you know that, to make them last. Mm. Did you smoke when you was in, Nick? I didn't, no. <laughs> <laughs> you did. It's been banned, oh, hasn't yeah. it, since then? It's been oh, banned. I'm not talking about... It's banned now. Huh? Banned, yeah. yeah. Banned. Oh, you can't smoke in Nick now? Band. Bloody hell, mate. Yeah. Oh, jeez. A lot of Nicks, yeah. Yeah. No. So, going viral then on, on the internet, how has that changed your life? Have a lot of people reached out to you and recognised you? Yeah. It's yeah. been amazing. Yeah, it really yeah. has. I, 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 the interviews and the book is the book's what they're waiting for. Yeah. Because, I mean, uh, there are certain artists that have written the book, you know, and it just dies a death because... There's no content. You've got to you've got to have a little bit more than just forging. And then you've got to be the real deal. But there aren't any forgers now. There are no apart from this German guy, and he got Nick for it, you know. But there's nobody. You can't get away with it. Well, your stories are perennial, isn't it? You've captured a unique era. Oh, absolutely. You? Yeah. That's why I'm glad you picked up on that. Yes. You know, reading the book, I picked up yeah. on that, and the way Tony's. Um, Phrased it all, it's, it's classic, yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah. but it's all, we didn't use artistic license, we add that up, I mean, mm. I, you know, I mean, it, it, I, I sit here and thinking, yeah, I remember doing that. It mm. just never leaves you. If, yeah. you've re, if you've experienced it, it's reality. I yeah. mean, the circus stories are, are some weird oh, on there, you know. circus stories. I mean, Rog I, I, we, we've seen Rogana. Mm. Rogana was an act which was... Uh, in Bertram Mills, I told you when I left uh, the circus, I joined, I uh, no, Bertram Mills in Olympia. Rogana had, she was stunning. She used to go up a ladder, right, with a sword, a dagger in her mouth, and a sword placed on there. And she used to go up backwards, and if it fell, you did But we knew what you used to do. I, used to, I, I was a flunky, so I used to go out, I used to go in the changing room, she was like, whatever, looking, oh God, man, you know this story. And I used to pull back a slot, on the, on the dagger, so it just fit in, so it couldn't go either way. Mm. So she'd go up the ladder, come back down again, pull the sword out, and then go boom, plunge it into a piece of wood, and it'd go boom, boom, mm. all part of the act. She, used to, she was, and also I used to deliver a bottle of brandy to Coco the Clown every day, <laughs> every day. The Coco the Clown. Yeah, and we used to get he people. brandy. Yeah. <laughs> We, this guy came in today, he, he was a fire eater, but he, he bloody inhaled instead of blowing. So we blew his lungs out. Yeah. What? Yeah. yeah. Ouch. I was in the ring when he did it, yeah. So there's quite a few risks mm. in the circus. Oh, I loved it though. What was your favourite act to watch? Rogana. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Especially when I go to the changing room. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I did. I did like. Oh, I did like the uh, the Elise horses, mm. but unfortunately, I made a mistake. There, I pulled the bloody French out just as the second horse was coming in. It it flew into the ring upside down. I got pulled in for that. <laughs> wow. Bertram Mills were 
you know, Bircher Mills were a very successful circus, but Chipperfields was a family. But do you know who got done, you know, Mary Chipperfield? She, mm. she wasn't that such a nice, but Dickie Chipper. I, I saw, I, I told Tony the other day, there was a, a Marion put up a post that in Brighton, the circus in town. Now, I was with that circus, but I was at the station with six other elephants waiting in the goods wagon for the parade. Mm. So, you know, so it all fits. Mm. Well, anyway, that has been a great interview. I've, I've oh, been amazed at. Enjoyed it. You've yeah, got some nice bits there, haven't you? Fantastic. Yes. Really appreciate you spending time with us. I think it's about two hours. Almost two hours. Almost yeah. two hours. Yeah, God, yeah. that's just part one. <laughs> Chapter 1. Calamity and Kindness When I heard the clicking heels descending the concrete steps to our pokey flat in the basement, I stopped drawing for a moment, listening for the door knocker on my mum's broad Yorkshire tongue as she lashed a visiting rent collector or tallyman. But today was different. The footsteps were different. The voices were different. My mum was speaking softly to a woman, muffled behind the closed door of our tidy parlour. I was carefully shading in Mickey Mouse's mouth and eyes, planting a broad grin across his face when the glimmering electric bulb above my head fizzled to nothing. Mum, I called out. A burst of light suddenly struck me as my mum opened the cupboard where I was sitting in the darkness. He likes to do his drawings in here, my mum explained to a stocky lady in bulging blue stockings who was peering in at me. Come on, out they come. He has a lot of hair, doesn't he? observed the lady as I sprang from my cubby hole. His father was the same, my mum huffed. I showed my picture to the lady and she smiled, squinting against the low October sunshine which streamed through the rips in the curtain. It's jolly good, praised the lady. You like tracing? she asked. I shook my head and I told her, I never traced it, it's a sketch. Really? she uttered, somewhat surprised. Then asked my mum, How old is he? Six. The lady glanced at my grubby feet and inquired, Does he have any shoes? My mum explained, His brother's got them at present. He's took school today. That's perfectly all right, the lady assured her, smiling sympathetically. We have plenty. They went outside and I heard the lady say in a hushed tone, It's for the best, Mrs Harris. After the lady had gone, my mum dug deep to find her tanner to put in the meter, and I returned to the privacy of my enchanted cupboard to continue with my sketch. When my brother Tony returned home, my mum called out from the scullery, Max, in here, I need to speak to the... We slurped mushy Weety Bix biscuits in water, as she told us. Tomorrow you're going away on a wonderful trip, just you two. Not your brother Kenny, nor your sister, just you two. You understand? How long are we going for, Mum? asked Tony. Not long, and you'd better behave yourselves, she warned. And just to make things easier, Joe, you'll use your proper first name, she told Tony. And you, she said, turning to me, will call yourself Harold. Harold? I shrieked. Harold Harris, she confirmed. But why? I grizzled. My name's Max Brandrett, ain't it? Your brothers are Aris, your sister's an Aris, and you'll be an Aris. Harry Aris, she decreed. Whoever heard of Max Aris? It doesn't sound right. Then, hugging us both tightly, she sniffed. Joe and Harry, me two boys, me two precious boys. The next morning, Joey and I ran out the steps to sit on the wall outside the house to wait for whatever it was we were supposed to be waiting for. The ornate iron railings were missing, commandeered maybe ten years earlier in the early 1940s, to make spitfires or tanks, and it meant that us boys could drop down to our flat like intrepid parachutists rather than use the steps. Above our flat were three further stories housing half a dozen families or more. The neighbours were friendly and they loved my mum. My mum wasn't the tallest, but she was pretty. And despite her second hand clothes and scant makeup, she always looked well groomed and fashionable. But it was her kindness and generosity that made her special. 
Spotting her neighbour, she would cry out in a loud as gizberese, Eh, hey, don't stand there like a wet week. Come in for a couple and a fag. And she would have given away her last penny. Our road, Buckingham Road, Brighton, was a wide street of large Victorian terraced houses, mostly split into humble flats, occupied by railway workers and hotel skivvies like my mum. Some entire houses were the homes of rich families, and the reason my mum had moved south was to enter domestic service for the Powells, and particularly to care for an elderly gentleman. My mum held down four jobs, presumably because she couldn't hold down her husband. I didn't know my father. She had mentioned to me once that he was tall and handsome, theatrical and flamboyant, with a magnificent mane of wavy hair. I'd also heard her tell others that he was a womanising rat and a no-good spiv, who made a living by duping punters into paying for his spurious racing tips. A shiny green Morris Minor traveller came into view up the street, chugging slowly in our direction. A man in the passenger seat was peering and pointing at the house numbers, gesticulating to the lady who was driving. Eventually, they came to rest alongside us. My heart pounded. Hello, said the man in a loud, clear voice as he stepped out of the car. Are you the Bernardos, boys? We shrugged at him. He looked like a park keeper in his rough navy blue jacket. I didn't like him. The lady, however, was tall and elegant in a grey, velvet-trimmed coat and matching hat, and she wore spectacles like a schoolteacher. Hello, boys, she greeted. Where is your mother? We led them down the steps and through to the scullery at the back. Mum was outside in the yard, wringing a penny through the mangle. She stopped abruptly and prinked her hair. I'm Mrs Gibson, said the lady, smiling and shaking my mum's hand. This is Mr Odin. Here, said Mr Odin, we brought these for the boys. And he handed Tony and I a pile of neatly pressed clothes. Joey and I were sent to the bedroom to dress while the adults went into the parlour. We excitedly ripped off our ragged shorts of pullovers, flinging them in a messy pile on the floor, and adorned ourselves in their smart grey replacements. I pulled up my new itchy wool socks, and Tony helped me lace up my generous black shoes. I think my mum was quite shocked when she came from the parlour and saw us. Do they have anything else to bring with them? asked Mrs Gibson and my mum sheepishly shook her head. I grabbed my pencil and pair of stubby wax crayons, one green and one yellow, and my thin pad of thick coarse paper, and I was ready to go. Joseph looks a little bow-legged, observed Mr Odin. Ricketts? inquired Mrs Gibson. My mum nodded and sighed deeply. I've tried to, but I just couldn't. It's all been sore. And I could see that she was overwhelmed and fighting to hold back her tears. It's all right, comforted Mrs Gibson. We'll soon have him right. Outside, on the curb, my mum hugged us and kissed us on the cheeks. Then, wiping her eyes, she turned to Mrs Gibson and asked pleadingly, Will I be able to, I mean, will I ever see? They'll be well taken care of, Mrs Harris, Mrs Gibson assured her. Harold, Mr Odin called out, holding open the rear door of the traveller. Harold! he snapped again. It was a moment before I realised that Harold was me. Joey and I climbed into the car and sat bolt upright on the back seat, as instructed. It was a lovely motor, with tan leather seats and a gleaming chromium steering wheel. The next-door neighbours, Mr and Mrs Russell, had come out to see us off. She with a fuddy-duddy 1940s hairstyle, and he in his dapper waiter's waistcoat and bow tie of the Southern Railway. As we drove away, I glanced through the rear view mirror and saw my mum fall into Mrs Russell's arms. Would you like a lollipop? asked Mrs Gibson. Somewhere en route to wherever it was we were going, Mrs Gibson stopped to drop Mr Odin off. She pulled over by a park gate, and I nudged my brother in the ribs and whispered to him, giggling, I told you he was a park keeper. When we set off again, I saw Mrs Gibson's kindly eyes smiling back at me in the mirror. Boys, she said gleefully, I am taking you to a wonderful place. 
As I observed the changing landscapes, I drew cows and sheep, buildings and cranes, cars and horses. I felt almost overawed with subject matter. This is it, Mrs Gibson announced some hours later as we slowed down and turned in through a set of broad metal gates. Can you read the sign? We looked bemused. It says, Dr Bernardo's village. This is where you're going to live. We gawked out of the windows with bulging eyes. Our heads were spinning frantically from side to side. A vast garden opened up before us, lawns with circular beds of flowers and shrubs, fountains and gazebos, a large village green, a sports field, a swimming pool, dozens of pointy roofed cottages, a church and a hospital, all encircled by a jungle of giant trees. It was magical. This way, Harold, instructed a lady called Mrs Carter as I tried to follow Joey, who was being led off in the opposite direction. You are staying in Joy Cottage because you're a bedwetter. If you could be a good boy for seven nights, we may let you join your brother. There were lots of boys in my dormitory. Obviously, I was the new boy. I knew no one and I knew nothing. Mrs Carter showed me to my bed and introduced me to Dougie, who had the bed next to mine. After bread and jam and the Lord's Prayer read by Mr Carter, we settled into our beds and Dougie explained the drill. At half past eleven, George comes. Who's George? I asked. Sewer George, the sewer man, said Dougie. He takes us to the bog if we're desperate for a slash. You'll see. The light went out and I snuggled under my blanket, cheering myself up that it wouldn't be long before I was going home again. What seemed like a moment later, a man's voice echoed in the darkness. You want to go? Do you want to go? When the voice was above my head, I peered out and saw in the torchlight that Dougie was putting on his slippers. He beckoned me and I followed. We filed downstairs to the latrine and relieved ourselves. I went back to bed with a relieved mind and an empty bladder, but I still had to squeeze my legs together as tightly as I could. A woman's voice startled me and the lights flashed on. I was so shaken that it took me a moment to realise that I had slept through the night and it was morning. The boys all leapt from their beds and I did likewise. We lined up, two lines of fifteen boys, and stood in silence as a fat nurse executed a bed inspection. She passed along the rows of beds, flicking back the blankets and wiping her chubby palm across our sheets. Good boy. Nice and dry. Yes, good boy. Good boy. You dirty boy. Get this sheet off at once and wash it. It was still pitch black outside as the naughty boys were banished to the middle of the green to publicly scrub their bedsheets clean in a trough of icy cold water. The humiliation was seen as a cure for wicked and willful bedwetters. And I so got used to the routine, I counted down the nights on my fingers. I had succeeded in not wetting the bed for six nights on the trot. Next was night seven. Hopefully my last night away from my dear, dear brother, Tony Stroke Joey, as long as I could hold it in. I went to bed. I was missing my brother immensely. I kept thinking about him. I was excited. I was anxious. I was tired. I was warm. I was warm. Then I heard Seward George's voice in the darkness. You want to go? Do you want to go? I realised then that it was too late for me. I'd already gone. My heart pounded. I lay still, totally still, not moving and not breathing, but waiting. You want to go? And I heard Dougie stir and put on his slippers and the padding of eager feet disappearing away down the steps. Under the cover of darkness, I slipped out of bed, yanked off my sodden bedsheet, grabbed Dougie's dry one, swiftly swapped them over and was, far as anyone was concerned, still fast asleep when they returned. I heard Dougie get back into bed and wriggle and moan uncomfortably. In the morning, there was a hell of a furore. You dirty boy, Dougie, dirty, the nurse yelled. And then to me, oh, good boy, Harold, that's seven dry nights. What a good boy you are. That evening, I was sent to Angus Cottage, where I slept soundly under the watchful eye of my beloved brother. The weeks rolled by and we ate three square meals a day 
including meat, attended daily lessons at school, and the pain which Joey suffered because of his rickets began to ease off, thanks to the regular doses of revolting castor royal and cod liver oil prescribed by the fat nurse. Joey was always looking out for me and standing up to any bullies that I couldn't sort out myself. We loved the fact that we had a proper football pitch at our feet and we were each given our own football kit, Arsenal for me and Chelsea for him. We wanted for nothing, except a cuddle from our mum. I think I missed her more than Joey did, although I suspect he put on a brave face so as not to upset me. We did receive letters from her, telling us that she missed us and loved us, and urging us to behave ourselves. It was a great comfort, and I felt sure any day soon Mrs Gibson would arrive and take us back to Brighton. Although I did cry most days, as many of the children did, the village was a happy place, and I was luckier than most because I could escape into my drawings. I had been supplied with pencils and crayons and paper, and I would while away any spare moments escaping into my little private world. It was exciting because Christmas was coming. I did pictures of the landscape and the cottages, all covered in icicles and snow and cheeky grey squirrels and robin redbreasts. We all helped decorate a huge Christmas tree with tinsel and baubles and sprigs of holly and pine cones plucked from the trees. The boys all took it in turns to help the girls stir in the Christmas pudding in a giant bowl. Father Christmas came and handed us each a bulging pillowcase. I was flabbergasted when I put my head inside and discovered a kingdom of toys. There were soldiers and horses, a car, a lorry, a lion, a jack-in-the-box and an aeroplane. All chipped hand-me-downs, but I was as happy as a lark. Later, after we were stuffed with roast and pudding, we had given thanks to the Lord. We were each called onto the stage in the main hall and presented with another special toy. Mine was a wooden duck on a cart with a rope to pull it along. It only had three wheels, but I thought it was smashing. We had been at Bernardo's embarking side for a year or so when Mrs Gibson came back for us. She smiled warmly and ushered Joey and I into the back of the Morris. This time we actually had things, such as clothes, to take with us. Are we going to see my mum? I asked Mrs Gibson as we drove away from the waving children and carpets of fresh bluebells under the trees. You're going to stay with the Andersons, she replied. You remember the Andersons, don't you? I remained silent, disappointed and sad that I wouldn't be seeing my mum. They are a kind American family who visit the village sometimes and bring toys for the children. You liked them when you met them, and they especially like you. The concrete prefabbed houses quickly gave way to green fields and twittering hedgerows. We passed a farmer with a giant shire horse and some boys playing on top of a pillbox and an airfield with bombers. At the end of the leafy lane, I recognised the car immediately. It was maroon, almost purple, and big. Behind it stood a large white house with black wooden beams and four tall chimneys. Mr and Mrs Anderson and their two sons came out to greet us. They had their own television set with a magnifying glass which enlarged the people's heads to the size of our own. We had wonderful times, all of us playing hide-and-seek in the orchard and outbuildings. We polished the car and did chores in the garden. But most of all, we adored the drives out into the countryside for picnics and to the seaside to play baseball on the beach and swim in the sea. Mr Anderson owned a washing machine factory. He was rich. Sit down, boys. Mrs Anderson and I would like to talk to you, said Mr Anderson. The thing is, boys, we have grown fond of you over these past months and we were wondering whether... You would like to live with us all the time. Yes, please, Joey and I both said together. Great, but here's the thing, he continued hesitantly. We're moving back to America, so we'd have to adopt you, and we'd all live in America. How does that grab you? The only thing is, Mrs Anderson cut in, we'd have to ask your mum for her permission first, before we could do anything. She'd have to agree or... The news wasn't good. Mum didn't agree. Mrs Anderson hugged me and, as she said goodbye, I wept bitterly and mourned what might have been. 
I've got you some lollipops, smiled Mrs Gibson as we drove away. Watts Naval Training School was a Barnardo's home which was pretty much as close to being on a ship whilst remaining on dry land. It had extensive grounds and a main vast old building, three stories high, which looked more like a cathedral than a ship, but it was run exactly like a ship. I was put in a dormitory with Joey up on the second floor on Lincoln Landing. The ship's company comprised of 300 boys or more and we worked to a rigid naval timetable. At 6.30am the bugle would wake us up and would jump out of bed, wash face, brush teeth, brush hair, clip short by the barber, dress in uniform shirt and shorts, ronic, polish, the wooden decks, attend prayers, eat our breakfast in the mess hall. Then, at 9am, we were marched out onto the parade ground in the front of the building and drilled up and down in perfect unison. In the centre of the square was a towering mast, commandeered from a bygone warship called HMS Woodlark. Standing to attention, we would be inspected by the captain, and God help us if we didn't pass muster. Any untidiness or imprecision, and we were hoiked out for punishment. I was a grog boy, tea boy, which kept me on the right side of the masters, but unfortunately it meant I had to wait outside the cookhouse door for delivery of a giant teapot and couldn't eat until I'd poured out dozens and dozens of cups of tea. Sometimes, when I did get to sit down at one of the long tables, the prefect would tease me and think it funny to deprive me of food. It was as a result of this that I got dysentery. Hungry and scrumping for pears in the orchard one day, one of the fruits must have been dirty and I ended up being as sick as a dog in the infirmary. A week after I was discharged, I still couldn't face any food, despite the fact that it was my seventh birthday. One of the masters, a kindly soul called Colonel Dean, and his lovely wife, who was always respectfully addressed as Marm Dean, invited me for a celebration tea at their cottage. She served me paste sandwiches and cake, but when she had left the room, I threw them out of the window. The next day, she summoned me to see her. Guess what the gardener's dog found, just there, outside the window, she asked me. Dunno, Mum. I shrugged. I think you do, she insisted, but I'm worried about you. You're very thin. You must eat. And she leaned forwards to give me a corned beef sandwich. Mum Dane, I moaned, staring up at her, wide-eyed. You never kissed me on my birthday. She chuckled and smiled. And if I give you a kiss, Harold, do you promise me you'll start eating again? I nodded enthusiastically, grinning from ear to ear, and her warm lips brushed my cheek, and I was instantly cured of dysentery. I have something else for you, she said, and handed me a large, expensive colouring in book. I know how much you love to draw, and I've seen how beautiful your pictures are. Thank you, I politely acknowledged. Sometime later, in the garden, she looked over my shoulder and asked, May I look? I could see that she was puzzled as she flipped through the pages of printed black line drawings. But you haven't coloured any of them in. I'm sorry, Mom Dean, I said, looking at the ground shamefaced, but I don't like colouring. I like drawing. Then, flicking through the formerly blank pages on the reverse side, she gasped. Did you do these? I nodded nervously as she examined my work a dramatically shaded autumn landscape, a sketch of the school chapel, a respectful and glamorous cartoon of her, plus various pictures of cars, boats, trains and hedgehogs. Well, Harold, you really are quite the John Constable, she praised. She obviously passed on her glowing approval to the masters, as I was called to one side by a teacher called Mr Runcie and presented with a box of watercolours, oil paints and art paper and in order to avoid the boys who liked to deride and antagonise me, I was also granted special permission to paint my pictures in the peace and privacy of the school's museum. It certainly suited me, and it proved to be a wonderful advertisement for the school when visiting dignitaries paused to watch me paint. Joey and I were told that we had been accepted for placement in a foster home in Suffolk. It was considered that I might benefit from the surroundings, 
and my brother would be taken in with me. Mrs Gibson arrived and we climbed onto the back seat of the traveller on our way to another adventure. I haven't actually met the Reverend, said Mrs Gibson, but I feel sure that he's a very nice man. What's a Reverend? I asked. A rector, she replied. You know what a rector is, don't you? It's like a vicar, said Joey. Oh, I sighed. Will he be taking us to America? Mrs Gibson passed us each a lollipop. Now, follow me up here, boys, directed the Reverend Sodden, stooping as he went upstairs and onto the landing, his pipe smoke trailing behind him like a steam train. This is my office, and in here, this is where Lord Nelson's mother was born. Are there any ghosts? asked Joey. Of course there's no ghosts in the rectory, huffed Mrs Fish, the housekeeper. Well, I've never seen one. And along here, continued the reverend, is your bedroom. Joey and I peered inside at the two little beds that were almost lost in such a large room. The cavaliers hid from the roundheads in the rectory during the English Civil War. Are all these pictures yours? I asked as we trotted along behind him through the maze of passageways and rooms, upstairs and downstairs. Most of the portraits belong to the church, he answered. Personally, I prefer landscapes. Barsham Rectory was beautiful. We climbed the trees in the surrounding woodland, swam and fished for tiddlers in the River Waveney. The nearby school was a cheerful place, and when I wasn't chasing the girls, I painted. I did a watercolour of the Anglo-Saxon church and an oil painting of Lord Nelson, which I copied from a book. It was a busy house, with visitors coming and going, and we had wonderful meals. But when I felt lonely or sad, I would sit next to the fish pond and think about my mum. The Reverend Sodden was a kind and gentle man. I am very sorry, boys, he apologised one day, coughing weakly into his handkerchief. But I'm afraid that it is no longer possible for you to stay here. Mrs Gibson arrived and told us that Mrs Fish, the Reverend's housekeeper, and her husband were prepared to take us in. Much to our glee, we were delivered to a village sweet shop, which was run by Mr Fish. He was a nice, if naive man, and the temptation of living above a limitless supply of Horlicks tablets and Mars bras proved too much for us. In a matter of weeks, it was noted that the stocks of sweets were much depleted. Mrs Gibson returned to collect us, and this time there were no lollipops to console us on the long and silent trek back to the naval training school. The school had its own railway station, and when the boys were old enough to leave, we would take a short walk to Bintry Lane to board a train to freedom. A special made-up song would ring out as they left, expressing a widespread desire to escape. On occasions, pupils would run away as far as the station, only to perish under a train. It wasn't talked about. My brother and I kept our noses clean and managed to ingratiate ourselves to the master sufficiently that we were included in a school cramping trip to the north coast of the county. Seventy boys travelled the short distance by railway and hiked the final mile to an empty field above the beach. Upon arrival, we built our tents and dug latrines before plunging into the cold grey waves for swimming races. As well as football and cricket, the masters also planned a devilish cross-country race. Although Norfolk was supposedly a flat county, the circuit would include running up a hill to the peak of an impossibly tall cliff, referred to by the locals as Beast and Bump, then back down again, then away across some miles of scrubland, then back up to the pinnacles of the finishing line. It was a daunting challenge, but the winner would receive a mouth-watering prize of half a crown. It was, I decided, an opportunity too good to miss. As I padded breathlessly through the heavy mounds of sand, I spotted my chance to cut out a huge chunk of the exhausting route by hiding in some bushes. I crouched down and waited there, and presently, when the three leading boys came chugging by, I darted out behind them and ran like their clappers. My ears were suddenly ringing with the cheers and yells of the enthusiastic masters. Go on, Harris, go on, boy. 
As I sprinted past my weary competitors and flung myself through the winner's tape, they gasped begrudgingly. Well done, Harris, though there was more than a hint of suspicion in their tone. Never had you down as a runner, Harris. Well done, said Colonel Dean, as he shook my hand and awarded me my silver half-crown. My victory didn't go unnoticed, and, apart from the cash, it earned me a kiss the following day from a girl on the beach. She had blonde curly hair, but not only on her head. I couldn't help but notice she had a sprig of fluff sprouting from the side of her swimming costume. It fascinated me, so much so that I made a sketch of her, complete with a frizzy adornment. I was later confronted by an outraged teacher who pointed at the offending matter with disgust and demanded, "'And what? What is this boy?' "'It's public hair, sir,' I answered quite innocently, and was summarily corrected for my insolence. It was always slightly nerve-wracking to be summoned down into the basement of the school where the officers were located. Joey and I were called in and told, "'Your mother's coming to see you.' We hadn't seen her for some years, and I was both excited and apprehensive. "'She ain't coming. It's near a couple of boys on the way to the playing field.' and I scrapped with them until they were bruised and blooded and ran away. It was a crisp, bright morning, and I eagerly washed, dressed, prayed, and ate, aching with pent-up excitement. I waited for the whistle to blow, then fell into rank and marched smartly out onto the parade square. I lifted my chin and raised my feet higher than usual, and marched along with a spring in my step. Although the drill dictated that we maintain eyes front, I felt my gaze wavering spontaneously seeking out my mum's wavy, coiffured locks. It was Joey who spotted her and subtly gestured for me to raise my attention upwards. On the next pass, I glanced up and saw her standing aloft on the top-floor balcony, with shorter hair and a strange man on her arm. "'Dummy rumbling?' the captain asked as I stood to attention for his inspection. "'I've got the collie wobble, sir,' I told him, which caused a titter amongst the boys. Pull your socks up, boy, he commanded. Then to his aid, hole in sock, on report. Before the obligatory punishment of standing out on deck for half an hour, I was granted permission to see my mum for ten minutes. She hugged Joey and I together, squashing us and planting soppy red kisses across our mouths and cheeks, and then shrieked, By heck, boys, look how you're grown. They must be feeding you, right? Smiling, doe-eyed at her companion, she announced to us, Boys, this is Sid. He was a stocky man with large hairy hands which barely protruded from the sleeves of his black oversized jacket. Sid's living with me now, said my mum. He's from Newcastle. You'll love him. He used to work down pit. Aye, I love this woman to death, purred the Georgie coal miner. And suddenly he burst into song, serenading me mum with a rendition of On the Street Where You Live filling the cold air with how tall and heartened he felt, just to have my mum nearby. My mum stared sweetly into his eyes and they kissed on the lips. Mum, are we going home? I asked. Not to dear, darling, she sighed. She gazed at me longingly and stroked my face, a smile bathing me in a moment of warmth. Her eyes sparkled with sadness. She didn't cry, none of us cried, and then she was gone. My favourite spot at school when I wanted to be completely alone was down on the river bank, beyond the open-air swimming pool. I would sit there and weep, reflecting upon the quietly passing water and singing an Irish ballad about people who found themselves a long way from home. If you ever go across the sea to Ireland, then maybe at the closing of your day, you'll sit and watch the moon rise over Claddagh and see the sun go down on Galway Bay. Just to hear again the ripple of the trout stream, the women in the meadows, making hay. I didn't know what it was called, or where I picked it up from, or truly what it was about, but it made me feel better. Mrs Gibson came and took us to a place called Bell Farm, somewhere near Ripswich. Best behaviour, boys, Mrs Gibson warned us. This could be your last chance of being fostered. When we arrived, the shabby wooden door squeaked open and a little man with a handlebar moustache appeared. 
Who is that? Boomed a woman's voice from indoors. Is it the orphans? Yes, my dear, it's the orphans, the man called back. Then to Mrs Gibson with a pronounced Suffolk burr. Oi, Martha, come in, come in, come in, lads. A hairy-faced woman in a billowing frock came bouncing into the overcrowded parlour and flung her flabby arms around us and slobbered all over us. There's be Mabel, my messes, grinned Arthur. The woman spurted excitedly. We're so excited, ain't we, Arthur? Yes, my dear, Arthur instantly replied. Most excited. Mrs Gibson left us boys with a telling raise of her eyebrow. Oh, look at you, you're so adorable, drawled Madame Mabel. Gear us a kiss. Mr Arthur giggled nervously as his wife accosted us with her tongue. Have you had your dinner? she asked. I've got dinner. Now, you sit down here and... May I go to the toilet, please? I requested. Toilet, toilet, yes, yes, this way, she bade me. Now, what's your name again? Harold, I said. Harold, what a lovely name she complimented as I followed her through the tight, smoky kitchen. Opening the back door, she pointed outside to an ancient brick privy and handed me some pages of old newspaper. There's no lavatory or cistern, just a metal bucket. There, sit down at the kitchen table, young Harold, she prompted when I'd returned from my pee. Arthur, you lay out the plates. Hurry up, or it'll be cold. Arthur! Right, my love, he uttered and quickly set out some cracked, off-white dinner plates. Mom Mabel carefully lowered a large, steaming, sizzling pot onto a landing pad in the centre of the table. We looked on excitedly as she lifted the lid and great puffs of delicious steam erupted from the vessel. She dipped a blackened ladle into the depths of the bowl, then sloshed out some disgusting grey, greasy gloop onto our plates. Don't be shy, she slurped. Spitty projectiles of chomped up chicken skin into our faces. We held on to our stomachs and stared at our plates, trying to ignore the horror as she slobbered her way through flesh and bones, devouring legs and wings and the parson's nose. When she had finished, she let out a series of short belches, slumped back on her creaking chair, and instructed us to clear up the plates and wash them. Arthur assisted us and gave us directions on how to pump up water from the well. Mabel departed, and we later found her in the parlour, drifting away on a tiny sofa, humming along to Bing Crosby on the wireless. Do light the lamp, Arthur, she grumbled. There was an unfamiliar hiss of gas, then a glowing white illumination from the brass lamp on the wall. Almost every inch of the walls and shelves were filled with pictures and trinkets, mainly miniature jugs and floral plates. There must have been hundreds of them. Sit here, sit here, she urged us, patting the dusty cushions on either side of her. We sat down, and she spread her weighty arms across our shoulders. Ben Crosby was called Harold, she divulged, kissing me wetly on the cheek. Harold Lillis, did you know that? I oh, didn't. There, you're famous, she beamed kissing me again and again. In the morning, we were woken up at 6am and we washed ourselves down in the yard and given vile bread and dripping. The local school was two miles away as the crows flew, but further on foot. It was obvious from the moment we walked through the gates that we weren't welcome. Stick with me, said Joey, as a dozen sets of hostile eyeballs followed us across the playground. At playtime, a ruffian snarled at me. Oi, foundling, can you fight? Joey wasn't there. I was on my own. The boy was bigger than me. Kid circled around to watch. I punched him in the face. He grabbed my throat and tried to pull my head down. I overbalanced him and we rolled around on the tarmac, wrestling and kicking. Suddenly, I found myself suspended by the collar, my feet dangling above the ground. You want to fight, lads? boomed the gorilla-like man with curly sideboards, who held myself and my combatant aloft, one in each hand. Apart from semaphore signals and swimming, Watts Naval School taught you to be tough. Kitted out in giant boxing gloves, I sought the bully in the face and guts and it didn't stop, even when we was quivering and sobbing in a heap on the ground. 
The thatched roof at Bell Farm was in disrepair and prone to leaks during heavy downpours. Joey and I would cuddle our stone-hot water bottles and huddle under an old patchwork bedspread in an attempt to dodge the drips. I was normally sent to bed at 7pm. There, I would listen to Johnny Ray and Doris Day on a crystal set, which I'd made myself, while Joey would have to stay downstairs in the parlour and listen to the likes of Mrs Dale's Diary and The Archers. Although we hated having no running water or toilet or electricity, the Christmas we spent at the farm was a happy one. We helped to decorate a glorious Christmas tree in the parlour. Arthur built a blazing log fire in the hearth. Mabel cooked a tasty goose. We sang lively carols, and I was given a smart pen and pencil set. It was bitterly cold outside, but we enjoyed jumping around in the snow, flinging snowballs, and making snowmen and snowwomen. My paintings of the winter landscapes, horses and military generals, were much loved by Mabel and Arthur, as well as by the teachers at the school. I was dozily dreaming, half asleep under the bed cover one evening, as David Whitfield crooned, I'll make you mine, forever mine, on this our wedding day, the bells will ring, the choir will sing. Thud! The room shook. I jumped up with a start and looked frantically all around in the darkness. I nervously got out of bed and crept down the stairs to the parlour, my heart racing. The door was open. Joey looked over at me, shocked. Mabel was lying flat on her back on the floor. Arthur was kneeling next to her. He was gently slapping her cheeks. She groaned. Quack! Get help! Arthur yelled. Quack! I ran out the lane, barefoot and breathless, and slammed the neighbour's door knocker. We ran back. Arthur was crying. Mabel was still. More neighbours came. Arthur looked pale and drank brandy. They covered Mabel's body with a bedsheet. The doctor arrived. A gang of men lifted Mabel up and laid her on the kitchen table. Joey and I were sent to bed. When Mrs Gibson came in the morning... She was truly sympathetic and gave us lollipops. She didn't take us back to Watts. Where we're going is a marvellous school, she told us. It's a technical school where you can learn to be a motor mechanic or an electrician. Its official title was the William Baker Technical School, but it was simply known as Goldings, a name retained from its former glory as one of the grandest country houses in the whole of Hertfordshire. So, boys, what sort of thing would interest you? inquired Mr Wheatley, the mild-mannered headmaster, leaning back in his chair and twiddling his thumbs. Joey shrugged his shoulders, and I replied, Painting, sir. Ah! Mr Wheatley exclaimed, jolting his head back and smiling. Excellent, Harold. We teach boys painting and decorating here. I feel certain that we will make an excellent tradesman of you. Joey and I decided to learn printing, in preference to decorating, bootmaking or tin bashing or gardening. I hated it, although I was encouraged to paint in my spare time, pictures rather than walls, when Mr Wheatley realised that I had a talent for art. There was a printing press in the old stable block, and there I tried to understand the tedious and laborious intricacies of typesetting, which even our teacher of typography admitted was a puzzling business. Life at Goldings was less strict than the military-style regime we'd been used to and therefore was open to a dash of disrespect and recklessness. Although the teachers were generally committed to furnishing us 250 boys with a brighter future, some seemed to look upon school life as a war between them and us. We named our enemies the Gestapo and their most ardent member was a bully boy called Baldwin. Outside the upstairs landings were fire escapes and these were seen as, and sometimes used as, stairways to freedom. And so, on a warm summer's night, I instigated a daring escape plan. Seven of us, including my brother Joey, carried supplies commandeered from the cookhouse and went over the top, descending undetected into the garden below. Griffing silently across the lawn, we observed the enemy fraternising in the downstairs mess. We proceeded with caution, using the cover of the bushes until we were far enough away to make a run for it, and we didn't stop running 
until we were away and into the woods. Beyond the trees lay our goal, the magnificent River Bean, where we planned to set up a base camp on the river bank. When we reached the water's edge, we larked around in the moonlight, laughing and joking, but falling silent with fear every time a twig snapped or the undergrowth rustled or a dog barked in the distance. We woke up with a shiver in the morning and the river was blanketed with a cloud of floating mist. Water rats scampered about, ducking and diving in the swirling currents amongst the weeds and rushes. We ate some of our plain biscuits and some bread and jam, then charged around playing football and cricket. The sun rose and we lazed about on the grass, making the most of not having to do chores or studies and not being told what to do. As the day warmed up, we all stripped off and jumped into the river and swam and splashed around like a bunch of crazy kids. In the afternoon, we snapped off some branches to make a shelter before plunging into the cool, clear water once again. The next morning, after a comfortable night's rest on beds of leafy twigs and grass, we had our breakfast and played in the sunshine, rejoicing in the fact that we were free. We made spears out of sticks and tried to stab fish but failed. There were enough biscuits and bread to keep us going, although minor pangs of hunger were quite normal to us anyway. The river water was fresh and we sploshed around, frolicking and laughing like a pack of boisterous hyenas. Suddenly there was a whinny and a glip-clopping of hooves. We stood up and stared. A farmer was sitting on a hay cart a distance away, staring back at us. A girl in a long frock was sitting next to him, also staring. We were naked. The man smacked his horse and they disappeared. Do you think he'll tell anyone? The other boys nervously asked me. Nah, he won't be bothered. I reassured them. We were all still bathing and roughhousing when the expeditionary force burst out of the woods. Harris! yelled the Gestapo leader, Herr Baldwin. Baldwin's devil-eyed lieutenant, Herr Pratt, stood smirking at his side and his smirk remained when, later, he thrashed my bare ass in front of the entire school. My cohorts were less severely dealt with, based on the presumption that I was the ringleader. It was Joey's time to leave school. At 16 years old, he was considered to be a young man, old enough to make his own way in the world. As he walked away towards the railway station, I stood with a tear in my eye and sang him the old song from Watts Naval School, leaving down Bintree Lane. Life dragged on. They persisted in trying to teach me about the print trade, despite my total lack of enthusiasm. I managed to stand it for another year, filling my time as much as possible with painting. Finally, I received my call into Mr Wheatley's office. I was given ten pounds and a train pass, along with his wise words. Be lucky, be happy, and stay out of trouble, Harris. Yes, sir, I'll be keeping well out of trouble, sir, I grinned. And so, with a few odd bits of clothing and my paints in a haversack, I stepped out into the big wide world to begin my life. This podcast is sponsored by Gadfly Press. We are proud to announce the publication of Britain's number one art forger, Max Brandert, The Life of a Cheeky Faker. And from the back cover blurb, Max the Forger is an artist and gentleman whose colourful lifestyle has spanned over 70 years. He has lived under the strict regime of Bernardo's children's homes, been an elephant handler in the circus, lived rough, busked his way from Brighton to Bombay, sold his fakes up and down the country, dined with dukes, socialised with celebrities, associated with gangsters, served time in prison, and donated tens of thousands to charity. And through it all, he has never stopped smiling and loving life and missing his mum. Quote from the book. Mr. Brandert, I do not see you as a malicious criminal, sighed the judge. But why, oh why, do you continue to use your God-given talent in this way? I just can't help myself, Your Honour. It's like an addiction, I grinned. Available worldwide on Amazon, link in the description box below this video. Thank you for supporting our sponsor. Here at Boomer and Jen, 
we offer a wide range of organic or recycled clothing. We all know our planet is important. We only have this one. So it's vital that we all work together to slow down and reverse the changes to the environment. Whilst we all know that big industry are having a significant effect on pollution, here at Boomer and Jen, we believe that if we all make small changes, we can do our part. Fast fashion causes detrimental effects to the planet. Not only is nearly 20% of global wastewater produced by the fast fashion industry, but there is a considerable amount of fast fashion ending up in landfill. So let's move away from fast fashion items that are only worn once or twice and start wearing extremely comfortable, durable and environmentally friendly clothing and ethical jewellery. Boomer and Jen was founded in a quiet town in Devon in 2018. It has now gone from strength to strength as the world is becoming more aware of the current climate situation, helping our customers to buy sustainable, quality clothing. All of our products are fair trade and registered with the Global Organic Textiles Standard Association. Check us out on organic cotton clothing dot co dot uk